Yeah. Not too well, Rick. That's great. Yeah, turn it off. Okay, can you hear me now? I turned the mic on on the desk here. That oh, helps. Yep. Um, we've been waiting for our clerk to arrive. She's not here yet, but uh, we're not supposed to start any of these hearings till about 9.15. What I had set up when I will read the script at that time, but for committee members, I wanted to explain the procedure in which we're going to roll through these bills today. We only have three bills, SB 44, 147, and 148. Two of those are omnibus bills. And when we're looking at that, um, I think it'd be appropriate that when we're going through, for example, and starting on 147, where there are, are, are four parts to that bill, that we will discuss part one. And anybody who wants to testify in part one can do so at that time. Then we'll close down part two, one, and go into part two. That, that way, we won't be jumping around through this bill, and it'll be very difficult for us to and for folks who want to testify to to listen to other people on this particular aspect of the bill. So if there's no objections from the committee, I, I'd like to um, just take it down by the parts. Uh, and the same thing for 148, where we have five parts there. And, and all the parts are basically within the realm of education, but they are all very, very different. So um, it's almost like four bills in one and five bills in the other. So let's go by the part and we'll, we'll do that. Um, in the meantime here, um, I'm working on some of the retained bills, trying to figure out subcommittee work that we'll be doing on retained bills. We've been given the green light to go ahead with uh, our subcommittee work on retained bills. Uh, following this meeting, I'm gonna sit down here and, and try to look at which ones we might combine and work uh, in, the, in one particular subcommittee group. And I'll get back to members uh, on the committee in terms of uh, appointing people to the various subcommittee uh, uh, committees that we're going to have to have. Um, other than that, uh, I you know uh, we're basically now waiting for the Senate to go through a number of the bills which we have submitted to them. There was hearings yesterday on five of those bills. Uh, they're working on it, so I urge all to be looking at the Senate calendar and staying attuned to what is going on here. So you have the opportunity to um, um, testify in the Senate. So I'm gonna wait about seven minutes here, seven, eight minutes before we, we start at 9.15. Um, I'm waiting also for our clerk to arrive. So um, let's just take a, a breather, get a cup of coffee. And I know some of you have been waiting a while as it is, but uh, are there, is there any other um, information that anybody on the committee would like to ask at this time? This is kind of like an informal session for the first 15 minutes. By the way, we will not be accepting any bills today. We will not accept any bills today. Mr. Chair, I have a question. Yes. I was just wondering how uh, I am going to determine who wants to speak to what part of the bill. So I will explain it when we okay. open up every hearing. I will explain how we're going to wade through this so okay. that um, then the persons that want to speak on part one, they can put their flag up or their hand up and we can recognize okay. that. That's what I was suggest. And we'll take them in the order that they signed up. Okay. That got them in. Hey, Deb, could you promote me? Because I couldn't log in with your Okay. I hope everybody's enjoying a little bit of time off. Um, it was a little cool driving over the side of Mount Moose Lock today, black ice on the road, and it was pretty slippery. It then came down into Plymouth, and the temperature gained 10, 10, uh, 10 degrees just between Warren and Plymouth. Good morning, Barb. Good morning. An interesting morning. One more thing kicks me off, and I'm going to hit the roof. <laughs> Mellow out. Huh? Mellow out. I am. Uh, I don't let it stay with me. <coughs> Mr. Chair? Uh, yes. 
do I remember right on omnibus bills? It's we vote for I, everything's included. We can't say we like them all except part three or whatever. It's, it's everything, correct? When, when we look at an omnibus bill, the final product can be what we amend to it. We can, uh, okay. we can take uh, items out, we can put items in, but we have different rules than the Senate. Our, our additions to any bill have to be germane yeah. to that particular part or that any part of that bill. So um, yes, at the final, final work, if we amend anything, the whole bill will be amended. Okay. Um, to reflect that change, because we're going to be voting at the end on Senate Bill, for example, 147 or 148. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. As of this point, for folks that are out there, we have uh, people that have signed up to testify in these bills. Um, how many do we have, uh, Deb, on the first one or one? Seven. Seven on the first bill, that's 44. Of course, there could be others that sign in as we go. On, on the second bill, 147, 147 is another seven people. And, and the last bill, it's more, 11 on the last bill. As of last night, when I talked with Gen 4, we had five, five, and 10, now it's seven, seven, and 11. Unless we have somebody else from that's his sponsor. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Do you enjoy it? Nice job. Huh? Oh, thanks. I had Tony cut exactly four inches off. <laughs> I gave him a ruler and the scissors, and I took four inches exactly. <laughs> and he did. If it got to the point where he even braided, it would drop into the front. It was too oh. long. <laughs> so it's like cut it. Thanks. I was nine fifteen there. I was nine ten. Yeah, mine says nine ten. Yeah. This one's right. <laughs> We've got two clocks and three clocks oh, in this room. Yeah. Now our two, now all different. Good morning. Here it is kind of somewhere down the 
systems are made in the third song. I actually got back from dropping the kids off for the day, so I'm by myself. It's fantastic. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. Okay, it's 9.15, so I think it's time to open up this hearing. So I'll read the chairman's script for the committee and then um, explain how we're going to approach these bills today. Uh, welcome to everybody in the public and members of the committee uh, to Senate Education, or House Education. As chair of the House Education Committee, I find that um, that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with House Rule 67 and the governor's emergency order number 12 pursuant to executive order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. This is a public hearing of bills referred to the Education Committee. Executive session on pending legislation may be held. I will say right now that there will be no executive session following uh, the hearing today. Please note that there is no physical location for members of the public to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that all members of the committee and select legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through the Zoom electronic meeting platform 
and the public has access to contemporaneously listen and if necessary, participate in this meeting by the Zoom platform or by telephone. All necessary access information has been made available in the House calendar and through the electronic calendar on the general court website. The notice for this meeting complies with House rules and RSA 91-A. Anyone who has a problem accessing the meeting should call 271-3600 or email hcs at ledge.state.nh.us. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. I want to introduce the staff that are, are helping us, assisting and assisting us during this meeting. We have Jennifer Four, our committee researcher. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state whether there's anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. Uh, okay. yeah. um, all I have to do is say I'm Okay, yep, no problem. We're gonna hear the like we don't want to hear any drills or anything, okay? Folks, let's let the clerk take care of this. <laughs> Sorry. One. Representative Cordelli. Here in the committee room. Representative Baum. Here in the committee room. Representative Allard. Here in the committee room. Representative Blakus. Here in the committee room. Representative Moffitt. Uh, I'm in Concord at the dentist's office. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Foxton. Here in the committee room. Representative Andrus. Representative Andrus. She, she's not going to be here today. Representative Ford. You're muted. Still muted. There you go. Here, here in my home office in Chester alone. Thank you. Representative Home alone in Derry. I will be turning off the camera from time to time because it gets unstable. <laughs> Representative uh, Sodi. Here in the committee room. Representative Myler. Here in my home office in Kantuka by myself. Representative Bruno. Here. Representative Shaw here in the committee room. Representative Cornell. Home alone in Manchester. Representative Tanner. Uh, home alone in George's Mills, with, and my dog may bark. Representative Ellison. I'm Mary Heath here, subbing for Art Ellison today, and I'm here in Manchester, home alone. Welcome to the committee, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Break this down for you. Representative Mullen. Here in the basement in Bedford. <laughs> Life. I am here in Jaffrey, New Hampshire, and I am alone. Representative Woodcock. Here in Santa Clara, New Hampshire, with my barking dirty dog, Brady, and my wife. <laughs> At least your wife's not barking. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Representative Vlad. I'm here in the committee room in the LLB. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, for members of the public, uh, when we get into all the, the bills uh, that we have today, which are three, SB 44, SB 147, and SB 148, the latter two have um, various parts to them. Uh, they're omnibus bills. One has four parts, one has five parts. When we have testimony offered to us, I'm going to ask that people speak to the part that we're addressing. For example, when we get to 147 today, uh, there are no parts. But when, yes, there are four parts. There are four parts. We'll type part one. And folks that have want to give testimony referencing part one, that's when you will have the opportunity. If you also have information for us on part two, hold that. And we will discuss that and have you present on part two at that time. You may have something for three or may not have for three. So we'll work through it that way. That way we will not be jumping around from one part to another part. And folks, we will all hear the questions in the testimony referencing 
uh, specific parts of the bills. So with that, I'm going to open up the uh, hearing for Senate Bill 44. This is a bill establishing the New Hampshire Workforce Pathway Program. The prime sponsor of the bill is Senator Jay Kahn. Uh, I believe Jay may have gotten in late from um, Chicago. Uh, he attended a, a family activity out there over the weekend. Um, and I spoke with him and it, uh, I don't see him. And I don't <laughs> believe we have uh, others that are I, the administrative assistant for our Senator Klein. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so uh, what I will do is I will introduce the bill, simply identifying the bill, simply just not getting into the any of the rationale or content or the intent of the bill. And then we'll start taking testimony. Uh, and, and Senator Kahn asked me to introduce it for him if he's not here. So my name is Rick Ladd. I am a co-sponsor of the bill. I come from Haverhill, New Hampshire. And I'm here today to introduce Senate Bill 44. Senate Bill 44 is a bill that deals with and establishes a workforce pathway program in community college system of New Hampshire. With that, I'm going to um, finish my testimony and open this up to um, others who may be signed up to testify on SB 44. Okay. Are you ready for the first speaker? Yes, we okay. are. Okay, first speaker uh, is Anne Marie Manchin. A little out of practice, so give me. <laughs> Go ahead, Ms. Daniel. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Um, so my name is Anne-Marie Banfield. I'm an advocate for parental rights and academic excellence in education. I come here in opposition of SB 44. I was not able to testify in SB 44 when it was introduced in the Senate, but since then I have given this a lot of thought and uh, looked over the bill closely and have decided to speak before the House Education Committee. Roughly 20 years ago, the federal government pushed the School to Work Initiative it was considered a fad at that time and quickly dissolved because it didn't have anything to do with students' natural desires or what their parents wanted for them. It had to do with focusing on the needs of the employers and providing them labor. Students would be tracked into the vocation that the government determined was essential for employers. That's not student-centered focused. Those of you who are familiar with Mark Tucker knows that he spelled all of this out in his famous letter to Hillary Clinton during the Clinton presidency. Tucker's vision was for public schools to become a development resource system for employers, and he continues that mission today. So they came up with student learning pathways that would be developed for career pathways early on until students graduated from high school and into college and beyond. So Texas law today, for instance, requires students to choose a pathway in seventh grade. Did you know what you wanted to do in seventh grade? This is tied to the Common Core National Standards Initiative, which is a workforce development model in education. The model is not focused on academic outcomes or literacy, but workforce training and skills. In the 1991 report, the Secretary's Commission on Achieving Necessary Skills help change the direction of the nation's schools from knowledge-based academic content into an education philosophy where the emphasis is on emotions, opinions, beliefs, and with an emphasis on workplace competencies. When competency-based education was introduced to this committee, I sat in on those hearings and opposed the legislation requiring CBE, competency-based education to be implemented in all public schools. And I recall Chairman Ladd and I believe Representative Shaw serving on the House Education Committee at that time. There was a great deal of discussion over competencies that could measure student dispositions. It was clear to me, and there would seem to be consensus among representatives that competencies would not be used in a way to measure a student's disposition. Democrats and Rep Republicans agreed on this. The focus of competencies were to be to be used to measure academics and skills, skills that would benefit the students as they prog progressed and would help them in life, like time management and collaboration, for instance. 
But now we have social and emotional competencies that measure dispositions. Because SB 44 requires this program to be based on competencies, I cannot support it without defining competencies as academic or limiting competencies to specific skills, what will students, college students be measured on? Will it be on their attitudes on political issues? Will it be on their emotions? This program is part of attracting students from pre-K to the workforce envisioned by unelected bureaucrats pushing public education away from the liberal arts model towards a workforce training model. In addition, there are no provisions to protecting student privacy in SB 44. Competencies are now shared with colleges when students apply, high school students. SB 44 makes no provision for consent by the student to share competencies with another institution or a future employer. I listened to a conversation between the Department of Education and CTE coordinators around New Hampshire uh, roughly probably about a year and a half ago. One coordinator talked about how to get more students into the service industry because that's where the jobs are. That is not a focus on what is best for students. That is a focus on what is best for employers. If students are choosing career paths based on the needs of employers, what does that look like long term? What happens if their chosen career becomes obsolete? There was even a discussion on how long the students stay in these jobs. Someone suggested that some don't stay past one year. When SB, within SB 44, the language indicates that the purpose is to focus on meeting the needs of the business that is not student focused. That is in section two, um, part A. If you, look at the, if you look at the language. And in another section, it says that there's no cost to participants. Well, that's because the, this is, will be paid for by federal tax dollars. What happens when the federal feds cut the funding? Who picks up the tab? Um, in the notes from the Senate hearing, Senator Bradley expressed concern for federal funding ending. Uh, Dr. Susan Huard, Chancellor for the Community College System responded, but did not provide a definitive statement on when those funds would expire and who would be in charge of replacing that funding. She mentioned that, the, that currently CRRSA would be used to provide funding. CRRSA funding is based on emergency funding due to the pandemic. At some point, that funding will most likely end and, who is and we are left to spe speculate on who will be left to pick up that tab. Um, Chancellor Huard also said that there would be adequate funding for at least the next few years, but again, that we are left to speculate. Within SB 44, it also talks about this is that the resources will come from federal, the Federal Workforce Opportunity Investment Act. We can no longer rely on FERPA to, re, to protect personal privacy information due to the regulatory changes. How will student personally identified information be shared with the federal government? How will they then share this information? For instance, in FERPA, to assist research studies allows non-consensual redisclosure of personally identified, identifiable information that was provided by certain educational agencies and institutions to other such agencies and institutions. The lack of privacy protections in this legislation needs to be scrutinized. Since competencies now expand into measuring attitudes and values, how will these competencies be shared? Will future employers now have access in addition to, to the certificate awarded? The US Department of Education can now share information with the Department of Labor due to the regulatory changes in FERPA. There is nothing in this legislation that directs the community college to require students to review and consent for the re release of all competencies that will be shared if they apply to another college or to a job. I will send you a copy of a letter that was sent to the United States Department of Education sharing serious concerns regarding the proposed rule changes to, to FERPA. This letter was signed by the executive director from the American Association of Collegiate collegiate registrars and admission officers. The letter was sent 
in, because of the alarming changes to FERPA, and it highlights the nullification of individual privacy rights. They go on to say, they say this, in reviewing the regulatory changes proposed by the department, we are alarmed by several striking factors. First, the proposed changes represent a wholesale repudiation of fair information practices, well-settled <laughs> principles of notice, consent, access, participation, data minimization, and data retention, all undermined by the paradigm shift promoted by this proposal. Um, in, in order to get through this quickly, I will allow you to read the rest of it. I will send that to you and not belabor that point, but that is uh, that was their concern. Um, the lack of language addressed addressing is the need to protect these kinds of data should prevent anyone from, per, from supporting this legislation. I would certainly encourage you to read their letter. This is from the college system itself. In addition, according to Senate notes from SB 44, Senator French suggested a sunset provision since the sponsor, Senator Kahn, mentioned that this type of training is needed during the COVID pandemic. When federal funds run out, who picks up the tab? A sunset amendment seems like a logical amendment, but it was not added. Chancellor Huard also mentioned the potential to move to to the use of digital badges. These are digital badges that will eventually replace competencies. Again, nothing about protecting the privacy of the student's digital badges or consent to release the information. Has anyone looked to see if these certificates would qualify a student for a transfer to a university or college? There's nothing in the language that includes any follow-up with employers to see if the graduates are properly trained for the money that we are about to spend on training them. Nothing in the language indicates that this program will be analyzed in any way for effectiveness. It will be federal dollars, but that is still taxpayer funding. At some point, state funds could be required. Uh, finally, I'm just about done. Finally, VoTech and trade schools have been available in the past for students who want to seek an alternative pathway. They were chosen by students with a focus on what is best for that student. That's how we go back to a student-centered focus. This lessens the chance of spending money on a vocation that they may walk away from, from after a short time after completing it. When a government program is funded by the government and focused on the needs of the business, how long will these graduates continue in their chosen profession? Should there be skin in the game by those utilizing this program so they are more likely to take it seriously? When education institutions become a vehicle for employers, will they lose the focus on what is best for the student? From the discussion with C the CTE coordinators, that is a definite possibility. While employers can certainly be a, a resource, this redesign in public education is a complete paradigm shift to a workforce, workforce model. This is part of that model. This program is another step towards the seamless web envisioned by Mark Tucker, it is similar to, track, to the tracking system in European countries. And it should be noted that you won't see students finishing at the top on international tests in math and science in those countries. I would suggest that this legislation be turned into a study committee where all of this can be discussed and more. Is this what New Hampshire residents want for their children? Or is this a vision of Mark Tucker who, who most New Hampshire people wouldn't even be able to recognize? Job preparation is important for sure, but that cannot come at the expense of literacy and it cannot come at the expense of looking out for the well being of the students in our education system. So, for these reasons, I urge you to vote ITL on SB 44. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Banfield. Are you willing to take any questions? Uh, if you have time, I suppose, yes. <laughs> Are there any questions? Not seeing any hands up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next we have Susan Hewitt. Go ahead, Ms. Hewitt. Welcome, Chancellor. Are you there? Muted. I am. 
I am there. Thank you, Representative Lang. Good morning, everyone. I'm here to speak uh, in support of SB 44, establishing the New Hampshire Workforce Pathway Program. When Senator Khan and other folks created this, it is modeled after a very successful program in the state of Virginia. And I thought I would address a few of the questions that have come up uh, during the Senate phase of the bill, uh, which ultimately passed. Uh, the first question was, is this also a request for funding? While in the original bill, there was some suggestions about funding the current bill, this is not a request for funding because we believe that the funding sources already exist. Uh, there, as uh, the previous speaker mentioned, we owe funds are available. Uh, there will be short-term Pell, regular Pell, which is being increased. There are scholarship opportunities from entities like the New Hampshire Automobile Dealers and, and so on. So we think that there is money available for these short-term training programs for in-demand jobs. Um, we, we're talking about people who have already been graduated from high school and are in the workforce or just entering the workforce. This is entirely about short-term training as a launch pad for the next step that an individual uh, may wish to take. Uh, you might have the question of, you know, since there are organizations that already do this, is the bill really needed? One of the challenges is in fact, the, the silos that exist within our government and various nonprofits, in, including our colleges. And so our interest in this particular commission is that all of us will sit in one room and that, you know, oftentimes a commission is what causes the parties to focus around the table. For the community college system, there are many opportunities that are coming under the Biden administration in terms of grants. Uh, at one point in New Hampshire's history, we were very attractive to grants because we were seen as a prototype for the largest states. Well, that has changed. And now we frequently lose out on grant opportunities to larger entities like Florida and Texas and California. One of the ways for us to indicate to these grantors um, our interest is to have all of us together in a commission and to be able to cite within our applications that everyone that has something to do with workforce development is sitting in the same room. Um, I thank you again for your consideration of SB 44. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Chancellor. Are there questions for Susan Heward? Yes, Representative Cordelli. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chancellor. Um, I was just wondering about your uh, comments uh, related to a commission and getting everybody together uh, because there is no commission that I see in this uh, legislation. So I'm wondering what commission you are um, referring to? Uh, perhaps I'm using the wrong word by uh, describing it as a, a commission, but a, a, a group wherein we have uh, members of various state agencies uh, and members of various nonprofits, including the community college sitting together, uh, discussing the workforce needs of the state and the opportunities for short-term funding for those uh, Bills. Thank you. Are there further questions for, yes, Representative Luno? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Chancellor, for, uh, for joining us this morning. Um, I was wondering if you could talk with us just a little bit about um, how uh, Pell Grants might uh, be applicable to, um, um, uh, to, for folks that, that may be taking less than a full-time um, uh, you know, course load in order to get a, uh, you know, a high value credential, build, you know, build a high value credential. Sure. Thank you for the question, Representative Luno. Currently, um, students who are Pell eligible can either attend as full-time students or as part-time students, but those funds right now are directed towards certificates that are at least 16 college credits or more or full-fledged degrees, such as the associate degrees offered by the community college system. What the government is currently contemplating, they've, they've completed a pilot on funding for short-term training programs. So these would be things that are less than six months 
and are not necessarily credit bearing. So as that um, moves from pilot stage to full-fledged implementation, we'll have an opportunity to help students uh, and residents to uh, fund their, uh, you know, participation in, for example, LNA programs, basic uh, automotive technician. Uh, there are uh, in other states opportunities for people who are in the information technology area to become coders with short programs. So it's funding that has not uh, been available and is uh, very likely to be available shortly. Thank you, that's, that's excellent, Chancellor. Thanks mm -hmm. very much. Very good news. Representative Myler. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Chancellor, for being with us this morning. So my understanding is, is that this uh, bill would try to identify short-term opportunities for individuals to get certificates. This is not focused necessarily on a degree program, but more a certificate program that an individual may say, I might want to do this. Uh, based upon uh, my current uh, personal situation to try to advance myself into the workforce. Is that correct? Yes, uh, Representative Myler, that's absolutely correct. This is in fact not aimed at all at degrees. And in terms of certificates, it is only aimed at short-term certificates. So for example, this is not aimed at people who might want to be uh, licensed practical nurses but it is aimed at helping people who would like to take the very first step as an LNA to help them fund what is a couple thousand dollars, uh, whether they come through the community college system or some of the private nonprofits that also run those programs. So this is that first step um, when the bill was being conceived, we were thinking about the people who have been unemployed, particularly those in retail industries that, and in hospitality that have lost their positions. In conversations with individuals, we hear that uh, they would like to look at other fields where perhaps the, you know, the, the employment is more secure. So this is a help to them to move them into that very first step and obviously from our point of view, we hope that they will move through certificates and degrees, not only with us, but also uh, at the baccalaureate level. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Representative Woodcock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chancellor, thank you so much for uh, explaining more about this, this bill, much appreciated. I just, uh, my question uh, deals specifically with law enforcement. Is there any chance that the community college will be working with them in terms of uh, preparation? As we know, many of the police forces around the state currently have vacancies and, and uh, I don't know, helping students prepare for the criminal justice program or, or work activity? Um, well, Representative, that hasn't, I haven't heard anything about that yet, but we tend to, uh, you know, follow where the employment needs are. And if that is an area, um, we certainly have several uh, colleges that have uh, criminal justice programs and working with them to identify what the preliminary skill set could be. Um, it, that is something I could easily take to the various advisory committees to see uh, what we could uh, figure out. Uh, one of the things that uh, we have spoken about is the community college system is, uh, is beginning to use badges. Um, and these are uh, something that an individual can choose to display on his or her resume. But what a badge is, is it says that you've, you've got this particular set of skills. It may be in working with um, law enforcement that we can identify a specific set of skills that would lead to that first job. So we certainly would be interested. Thank you, thank you so much for your response and thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you very much. Representative Lay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, uh, uh, Chancellor, for taking the question. Um, my question just concerns who is eligible for this program according to the language of the bill. It's the uh, unemployed and underemployed New Hampshire adults. And then more specifically, the pathway program shall provide training to furloughed, laid off, dislocated, underserved, or other populations affected by COVID-19. So is this a limited program, limited to those populations? Because I'm sort of hearing, there seems almost like this assumption that anybody 
can apply for this, but that's uh, my reading of the bill is that's not the case at all. Uh, thank you, Representative. Um, you know, we always try to include uh, people who are interested. So while this, this bill is specifically aimed at the underemployed and the unemployed on account of COVID, and frankly, that's the way some of the uh, grants that we expect to be eligible for is worded, those are the primary people we would serve. But um, we always leave the door open a little bit for other folks, but they are not the primary audience. The primary audience is exactly as you've described them, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ch uh, Chancellor Hewitt, I have a question for you. I'm just trying to understand uh, some of the wording in the bill a little bit. Um, Currently within the Department of Business and Economic Affairs, the Office of Workforce Opportunity works with programs and partners to provide these workforce training opportunities and training that we're talking about. I understand within the combined state plan, the community college system is currently a member that a partner that works towards this endeavor. Um, then in looking at the bill, in Roman three, at the very base of the building, bill, just before the effective date, it says, um, partner with the Department of Employment Security, Department of Economic Affairs, Director of Workforce Development, and Career Technical Education Centers. How is this bill going to be more effective than the present format that we have here in the state through the uh, Department of Business and Economic Affairs going to improve our, our preparation of these people need to be retooled or uh, trained in another, another field. Thank you, Representative Ladd. I guess I would say that um, what's called for in this bill would enhance the pre-existing organizations. Um, my understanding of the Office of Workforce Opportunity and, and their um, management of WIOA, there are only specific uh, certificates that qualify for WIOA, but there are other possibilities um, that we would like to explore. So I, the sh my short answer is that um, this broadens the work and, and includes more entities than that which is specified in WIOA. Thank you. Are there further questions for the Chancellor? Uh, Representative Cordelli. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Chancellor, again. Um, you mentioned um, the uh, use of uh, digital badges, I believe. Um, now, I'm just wondering if, if that is a system developed by the community college system, or if you're using a, a third-party vendor for that, um, and maybe any additional information you could uh, provide to the uh, committee um, or especially myself, uh, I would appreciate it on the digital bad uh, system. I'm, I'm sorry, Representative. Are you saying digital badging? I, I can't quite hear yeah. you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so additional information. Um, we have uh, a, a, a committee, uh, a cross college committee that's working on this. We have um, adopted a, a badging product called Badger. In fact, um, a few weeks ago, President Larissa Baia from Lakes Region Community College announced the first badge, um, and that is being awarded to people uh, working in restaurants. Um, there was a short-term training program that was developed between the Restaurant Association and three of our community colleges, White Mountains, Lakes Region, and I believe the third one was Nashua. And um, in, in working with these uh, individuals put together, um, uh, it, it's kind of a safety certification so that people were uh, behaving appropriately in terms of food handling and, and treatment of guests and so on. Uh, we worked with the common man restaurants as well. Um, and badging is a way of um, capturing a particular set of skills uh, and they're actually embedded in the badge itself so that uh, individuals can post this on their resume if they so choose as they're looking for future employment. 
Um, the, this is a relatively new activity for us and we're looking at um, whether this translates in any way into college credit. We think likely some of them will and we need to, uh, as an organization, build a structure around that. But at this moment, the community college system is working on badging within our workforce training and non-credit area. Um, I can certainly send you more information about the product that we are using. I would also say that uh, the University of New Hampshire in their extension program has also begun to issue badges um, as a way of uh, collecting information. Um, we are, I guess we're kind of in the middle of this effort. Uh, other states are certainly ahead of us. In fact, this original badge that we came up with was based on conversations that I had with colleagues in Texas um, who had put together a similar program and began to speak with us about the value to individuals of colleges issuing badges. Thank you very much. Uh, Chancellor, I have one further question. Um, you're, you're, the, the program that's being recommended in SB 44 is going to be coordinated with various types of programs like the Department of Employment Security. What is the meaning of education agencies? Are you talking about the Department of Education seeing we're also referencing per technical education? I'm just trying to figure out where the Department of Education comes into play in this bill. I, I suspect it would be on the CTE side of things, Representative Ladd. Uh, we were not envisioning something larger uh, such as that which was uh, described by the previous speaker. Um, there are some uh, comprehensive high schools that have spoken with us about what kind of activity could happen the summer after graduation. So I do anticipate that we may have conversations with uh, comprehensive high schools that are interested in addition to the CTEs. Um, I, I honestly don't expect that that's the large part of this audience though. We expect that it is unemployed people, dislocated people, underemployed people that are the, uh, the focus at this point. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, are there further questions for Chancellor Hewitt? Not seeing any hands up. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the help and I do hope uh, that you will vote to pass SB 44. Thank you. Are there further folks? I'm sure. Yes, there are. Um, Lynn Carpenter, one of the most recognized. She is a member of the public. Good morning, Ms. Carpenter. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. can. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm also here to speak uh, in favor of SB 44. I am the program director for a grant funded program called New Hampshire Needs Caregivers. It's funded through civil monetary penalty funds to recruit and train 700 licensed nursing assistants to work in New Hampshire nursing homes. Over the past year of my program, New Hampshire Needs Caregivers, I've had over 700 individuals reach out to me interested in a career in healthcare specifically as a licensed nursing assistant. Um, there's a great desire for a career in healthcare. The barriers right now include um, access to training in different locations of the state and also access to financial resources. I've also found that individuals looking to start a career in healthcare need some coaching and support. And I'm sure as you all know, or have heard uh, numerous times, probably there is certainly a need for additional caregivers in New Hampshire. We have an aging population. The average age of our nursing staff is um, you know, approaching retirement age. So we certainly need more entry level workers. Um, re reiterating the statement um, that made by Chancellor Heward, the benefits to SB 44 really are to reduce the silos and establish a program for collaboration 
um, to develop wor a workforce strategy to define the issues and develop meaningful and effective actions to meet the workforce needs of the state. Um, personally, I worked as a nursing home administrator for over 20 years, uh, retiring from that career uh, about a year ago. And I can tell you in my own experience, there's always been a need for, for caregivers. I've also worked with several entry level uh, caregivers who really want opportunities for growth. And for those reasons, um, I ask that you vote in favor of SB 44. Thank you very much, Ms. Carpenter. Are there questions? Not seeing any hands. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you for your time. Have a good day. Business Industry Association. Is this the BIA? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Sorry. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Jewett. Welcome, Mr. Jewett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I trust everyone can hear me okay. Yes, yes, we can. Thank you. For the record, my name is Dave Jouvet. I'm a senior vice president with the Business and Industry Association. We are New Hampshire's statewide chamber of commerce. We are here in support of SB 44. And my purpose is to convey to the committee the uh, critical urgency of workforce needs with employers across the state. And I have to confess, even though I work on economic development and workforce development issues, it came as a little bit of a surprise to me um, we, over the past week, several weeks, have begun hearing from employers from all sectors of the economy on their difficulty in finding a workforce. And I say it took me a little bit by surprise because obviously we're still uh, in the middle of the uh, coronavirus pandemic and employers went a year ago from being concerned about workforce to being concerned about staying in business. Um, but that has changed dramatically. And we know uh, that the state's unemployment rate is uh, approaching pre-pandemic uh, uh, unemployment, which was among the lowest in the nation. And we are hearing from our members uh, that, that uh, workforce is again becoming their most critical issue. So um, I would encourage the committee to look favorably on this bill. It uh, will assist in programs that already are happening in the state, like the sector partnerships and the uh, programs through the Office of Business and Economic Affairs um, referred to by the previous speakers. Uh, this will better prepare those who are unemployed and underemployed for uh, the types of jobs that are readily available right now in New Hampshire. And um, frankly, unlike a lot of legislation, I see no negatives with this one, but only positives. So thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Jubé. I'm sorry for butchering your, your last name. That's, that's quite a, it, I think I did it, that. It's not the first time that's ever happened, Mr. Chair. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, are there questions from Representative Luno? Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thanks, uh, uh, Mr. Jouvé, for uh, joining us this morning. Um, just a couple of quick questions. Uh, just wondering what um, um, what organization develops the um, the sort of the is there a list of um, of critical workforce shortage areas or workforce needs? Uh, that's an excellent question, uh, Representative Luno. So thanks for answering it. I can only respond based on what I'm hearing from our members. And I should say um, the BIA covers a wide spectrum of uh, businesses and, uh, you know, covering all areas of the economy. We are, we have less members in the retail sector, the auto dealerships and restaurants, especially because they have their own associations that do a great job, but we cover uh, manufacturing, business services, financial services, and we run the gamut, uh, uh, utilities, public utilities, we run the gamut from the state's largest companies 
down to sole proprietors. So I can only tell you what I'm hearing. And what I'm hearing right now is especially coming from the manufacturing sector where they are finding it almost impossible to fill open positions, let, let alone find people that are well qualified. So, and a follow up on that, Mr. Chair. Yes, so, so, um, so thanks. And, and so the, the, the follow up question really is really sort of focuses in on the, the manufacturing sector, but, uh, but it, it, it's, it's really, it's, I, I think this has been developing for several years now and this, you know, acute workforce shortage uh, issue is, um, you know, tends to be a double edged sword when it comes to workforce training as well, because it means there's fewer people uh, available, um, let's say, for instance, at the community college level to, um, to staff these, these courses in, um, you know, whether it's engineering technology. And I was wondering if, if maybe uh, Senate, Bill might, Senate Bill 44, if it doesn't already, could, could, could help to um, um, extend the partnerships between the, the uh, private sector and, the, and, for example, the community college system to, to make sure that, um, that the community colleges are staffed appropriately in order to, uh, to um, you know, have instructor, instructors to, for the curriculum that's, uh, that's really necessary. Uh, to meet the workforce needs. Yeah, Representative Luno, I think those connections exist, but I think Senate Bill 44 will strengthen and expand those connections. I would say that a lot of the positions that are open now in manufacturing, um, I'm sure there are some that are highly technical, but many of these positions are those that are considered entry level. And so what, what employers are looking for is people with basic computer skills and literacy skills. I, I was, I guess, a little amused by a previous testifier saying that literacy, and I'm paraphrasing, but literacy, you know, wasn't important to employers. And I, I just was somewhat mystified by that because that's a, a basic competency that any employer is looking for. So um, the direct answer to your question is, I, I think those connections exist, but I think Senate Bill 44 will be very helpful in strengthening and expanding those connections. Great, fantastic. Thank you, David. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jubei. Further questions? Rep. Leon has a question. Representative Leon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Jubei, for taking the question. I have been speaking with employers in my area, and a lot of their needs are actually based on people not wanting to go back to work because they're receiving um, stimulus funds and other funds that, that mean that they don't actually have to reenter the workforce. Is that something you've spoken to um, members of the BIA, and have you seen how much that's impacting them versus training issues? Yeah, this is... A, a little off topic, but I would like to respond, Mr. Chair, with your permission. Um, there are uh, those in our membership who are concerned about that issue. They're also concerned about, uh, because of COVID-19, there was a waiver of the job search requirement, and that waiver exists to this day. The BIA this week sent a letter to the governor urge, and to legislative leadership urging that they rescind that waiver and, and that will help in some ways to get people back to work. Um, I, I think that's an issue. I, I don't know that Senate Bill 44 would have a direct impact on that, but there are certainly other issues relating to workforce that are, that are out there. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, Mr. Juve. Could you please uh, forward a copy of that letter to the committee? I would be happy, Mr. Chair, should I send it directly to you and staff for distribution or send a copy? You, you can send it to uh, myself and I will distribute that to all the committee members. I will do that uh, before the end of the day. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, further questions for Mr. Juve? Not seeing any, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think Senator Kahn is on the phone. Yes. I got that message from uh, Senator Kahn, and we're going, we're trying to connect with him right now. He's he's in the uh, he's on a panelist, and we can just unmute and speak. Okay, he's doing so by telephone. Uh, need to press star six to unmute Senator Kahn. Thank you. 
Senator Khan, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, are you in a plane on the ground in Chicago or back in New Hampshire? Yeah, <laughs> somewhere. Uh, I'm on a plane in Chicago. I can be quick, Mr. Chairman, and, and really just respond if there are any questions. Sounds like uh, you, there have been quite a few supportive uh, partners to this bill and uh, signed in with their testimony. Uh, and uh, I will say that in uh, states like uh, Virginia and Utah, uh, they began these efforts uh, and they were excellent. Uh, you still with us? Uh, you, can you still hear me? Yes, we can. All right. So the, the point was uh, this kind of uh, alignment was valuable when they had uh, a workforce shortage. Uh, it then became valuable uh, during the pandemic as well as more people uh, needed to find their way with more employable skills into the openings that existed. Uh, it's just a good vehicle to uh, put uh, the various pieces together and it includes uh, the BEA as a valuable partner because it's important for students who for unemployed and underemployed people to find their way into academic programs but also to find their way to the employers so that they get a vision of what the kind of training is going to be once they enter that position in the workforce uh, and what they job opportunities for advancement and uh, initial starting salaries are going to be. And, and that really is where the businesses come in and play a very strong partnership role, whether it's with internships or, or recruitment information. Uh, and, and certainly the BEA plays such an important role in keeping track of the uh, uh, labor economy in uh, the state of New Hampshire on a quarterly basis reporting uh, where the job needs are and updating their projections. So uh, this, this system of alignment, it, it, it works. Uh, and I think we have the talent in this state to align our resources uh, in, in a very effective way to assist uh, our employers grow our economy. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Khan. Senator Khan, can you please explain to, to me and the committee a little bit more about the, 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 the source of funding that comes from the Federal Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Will that now be funneled directly to the community college or is it still funneled through the Business and Economic Affairs Department? It absolutely is still with the uh, BEA. Uh, is a part of the BEA. And the BEA has some very good programs established, uh, like employer-based training programs, uh, which are really important, as well as as well as rapid reemployment uh, programs. So, uh, but but I think this is positioning ourselves for new dollars coming into the state of New Hampshire as well. Uh, if you follow uh, the current federal administration, uh, they do have uh, on the drawing boards. Uh, how to use Pell Grants to reduce the cost uh, of certificate programs and rapid employment through certificate programs in six-month periods. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. This has to be awkward. Uh, it's fine. We understand. Are there are there questions from the committee for Senator Khan? We're, we're not seeing any hands up, uh, Jay. So uh, thank you very much and have a safe trip home. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I wish this uh, had some pleasure connected to it, but uh, I'm sorry for the family event that causes me to not be able to be with you. Yeah, yeah we understand. We understand. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Okay, for next we have uh, one more. Yes, yeah, so this is Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah. we can. And we'd like to thank you very much for what you do with the uh, Council for uh, Career Technical Education. Uh, thank you for saying that. It's our pleasure. Um, I will be brief. Uh, my name is Dan Bennett from the New Hampshire Automobile Dealers Association. NHADA is a trade association for the motor vehicle industry in New Hampshire, about 500 businesses. Uh, we represent car, truck, motorcycle, snowmobile, ATV, construction, farm equipment, collision repair. Um, pretty much if it's got an engine and tracks or wheels, we work with them. So um, as mentioned, we've got about 500 businesses in all corners of the state, uh, in, in all communities. So we are here in support of SB 44. And later on today, I will forward over our fact sheet and testimony on this particular bill. We do work with the 20 high schools and five uh, colleges that have automotive technical programs. Uh, we work with them, we have for a long time, uh, very intensely. And we do a great deal of scholarship work uh, with students to get their career started, whether it's to help pay for credits or uh, help support maybe their first set of tools. Um, not all folks know that a technician who works at a dealership uh, those are actually their own tools that they pay for out of their own pocket. The, the business does not own them. So we help support that. Um, we believe that a homegrown uh, local workforce is key to our success. That's why we worked with the colleges and the high school CTEs for so long. Um, however, two-year programs, uh, two-year degree programs um, aren't for every, everyone. Some folks decide early on they want to work on a General Motors car and they wind up in Laconia for two years uh, or Honda and they want to be in Nashua and that's what they've committed to. But those long term commitments uh, for both the costs um, and also just, you know, interest level aren't necessarily there uh, and they don't they don't fit for everyone. So the bill that Senator Khan has proposed and that we've supported in the Senate as well, we kind of view it as it's an on ramp into our industry. It's a short-term offering to allow someone to get some exposure uh, to decide whether it's a good fit for them and, and, and where it's a good fit for them. Uh, some folks may have a, have a, a great interest in cars um, and, and they're really fascinated with them and it consumes them. However, they just don't have the mechanical aptitude to be deconstructing and rebuilding them. So uh, maybe a better fit for them is in the sales uh, on the sales force, or maybe as a service writer, maybe the technician isn't right for them. Maybe someone has a great interest in business and marketing. So they'll be in our finance and insurance office or business development center. Maybe you're very, very organized. So supply chain and inventory management is your thing. So you find out that you're actually a better fit for the parts department and the wholesale parts business. So short-term programs like um, Senator Khan and SB44 has proposed allows this initial exposure to find where and that best fit would be in our industry. And that's one of the reasons why we, we, will, uh, we do in fact support it. Um, we have an immediate need for a variety of workforce opportunities and it's not just technicians. Um, we've got a clear need to fill those, those vacancies with a, a talented and, and committed and trained workforce. Uh, so that's the reason for our uh, support of this particular legislation. So um, again, in, uh, in aiming to be brief, I want to uh, re-echo our support for SB 44, hope that the committee can support it um, and give it a favorable recommendation. And I will um, I'll forward over my testimony as mentioned, and, and if possible, I'll attempt to answer any questions that you all may have. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Bennett. Are there questions for the Automobile Dealers Association? Uh, Mr. Bennett, um, we have in this legislation that the certificate completion has to be done in not more than six months. Is six months the appropriate time for these types of programs? Do you need more time or can you do it with six or less months? 
My understanding is that the, the legislation is based on a successful model out of other states, I believe Virginia and Utah. And so it has been tested. So I would assume that the, the six is acceptable. You know, it is designed to be a short-term program so that you can clearly decide, do I want to jump in for another two years or a year and a half of schooling? Do I want to go right out into the immediate workforce um, and hope and be trained on the job and have the employer hopefully support it, uh, possibly through, um, you know, internal training offerings that they may have, internal mentorship programs that they may have. So uh, my understanding is that, uh, just to get back to it, that it isn't, that six month uh, does come from a tried and, uh, and, and tested program in other states. So I would assume that that's an appropriate number. Thank you very much. Further questions from the committee? Not seeing any hands up. Thank you very much, Mr. Bennett. Thank you all, have a great day. We, we also, for the committee, we have the uh, technical people from the Department of Education, Steve Appleby, uh, available if there's any questions for the department. Not seeing any hands or questions for the department. Thank, thank you very much. All right, is there anybody else? That's um, all I see. Yeah. Okay, with that, I'm gonna close the hearing for a Senate Bill 44. And we will enter into Senate Bill 147. Mr. Chair, yes. would you like to read, uh, like me to read? Sure, go okay. ahead and read. Uh, the supporters are 33, opposed three, zero mutual. And we were supposed to have seven testify, but I believe only six did. Okay. This one. I have seven. You do. Well, okay. I'm not excited. Yeah, Senator Khan was. Yeah, he was listed. Uh, okay. We had a person who signed up to testify that wasn't here. So uh, <coughs> seven signed up and six missed. Well, I got to just fly out. Oh. Well, I got to do it. Yeah. Okay. Well, still full. Yeah, that's true. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there is somebody with their hand up. I don't know. Is that for the next bill? Okay. So we're, we're going to go in ahead and enter into Senate Bill 147 at this time. This is a bill, it's an omnibus bill, legislation relative to student aid, central registry, transportation of students, and special education costs. Uh, so it's one of those bills which we've talked about at the beginning, where we're going to take it by parts. We're going to go through the first part first, and those that have... Um, uh, comments who want to testify in the applications for federal student aid, uh, they can do that initially as part one. Part two <coughs> will be the central registry. Part three, the transportation of pupils. And four, mitigation of special education costs. So with that, we're going to open up 147 and we're addressing part one, application for federal student aid. Do we have, if there are people online listening, if you want to speak to this particular part, will you please put up your hands, show us. You also have Senator Yeah, speak, I'm not sure which part and I, I don't, is Senator Khan seeing he's the prime sponsor, uh, if, is he available or if Senator Ruth Ward is available, maybe uh, Senator Ward. Yes, I see Senator, I see Senator Ward. Okay, I do not see Senator Khan any longer. Senator Ward, if you're out there, can you uh, introduce the bill? Um, if you can speak to, you know, briefly about the sections or, or the section you're involved with, that would be appreciated. Ruth, Ruth, are you are you muted? It's possible that she didn't hear. She's been on for a while. Do we have any reps or senators with their hands up regarding this bill? No. In any part? Okay, what I'm gonna do, uh, I'll do the same thing with this, seeing that uh, we know that Senator Khan, the prime sponsor is still out in Chicago. Uh, so I will 
introduce Senate Bill 147 for him on his behalf. I did talk to him earlier several days ago and he asked that I do it if he wasn't here. Um, I'm gonna introduce uh, for the record, my name is Rick Ladd. I come from Haverhill, New Hampshire, where I'm a representative. Um, I'm, I'm going to introduce Senate Bill 147. This is an act adopting omnibus le legislation relative to student aid, central registry, transportation of students, and special education costs. Um, I will not get into a discussion on any of these particular sections. I'm simply going to introduce the bill as I've done and, and, and close my introductory comments. Uh, Representative. Mr. Chair, we do have Senator Bradley in. I don't know if he is uh, speaking to a particular He would be piece. doing the special oh, ed, part I believe, four. Yeah. Okay. part four, Sorry. but he's welcome as a sponsor of some of this legislation <clears throat> to introduce it if he so desires. Okay, so uh, I can promote you. Would you like why, to do Why don't you promote uh, Senator Jeff Bradley? I'm not sure if he's okay. Oh, there he is. Good morning. Good morning, Senator. Jay is out in Chicago. So could you introduce Senate Bill 147 for us? Yes, uh, certainly happy to do that. Um, Senate Bill 147 is one of our omnibus bills. Um, there are four pieces to it. Um, one, the first piece deals with federal student aid. Uh, the second piece, central registry, the third transportation of pupils, and my section, which if I, um, Representative Ladd could testify to deals with uh, special education costs in small communities. So why don't you, Jeb, go ahead and present your section so you can get on to work yourself, and then we'll hop back to section one. Yeah, that would be lovely because I'm trying to chair uh, Senate Health and Human Services at the same time. <laughs> so thank you very much. So um, I introduced uh, part four of Senate Bill 147 because of what happened in one of the very small towns in Carroll County, Hart's location, which I think uh, Representative Cordelli is very familiar with. Um, in Hart's location, there was a, apparently a family that moved into the community, um, obviously qualified for special education services, but it was very expensive. And given that um, the town of Hart's location has so few people, um, it was a very significant and harmful impact on the overall tax rate of Hart's location. And from what I've been able to ascertain, this has happened from time to time in some of the smaller communities in our state. So I um, am proposing, and the Senate agreed with this, to add language to our um, RSA 186C18 special um, education state aid that the state could designate an additional $250,000 of aid in particular um, for the smallest towns in the state. Um, what I indicated was under a hundred, under a thousand uh, or fewer residents. And it would obviously be to mitigate the impact of special ed costs. Um, I, I clearly worked with Commissioner Edelblue um, when this first came to my attention to see if something could be done in the Hart's location um, situation prior to filing this legislation. He informed me that um, even though in the last budget we fully funded catastrophic aid, um, there was just no allowance in the statute for something that would be particular like this. So um, after consulting with the commissioner, I filed um, this section of the bill that was included in the omnibus and I commend it to you. I think there are probably a lot of communities that are very small that have a very large impact and would be helped by um, this designation of fund. My understanding is it doesn't, um, it doesn't create a new expectation of more funding. It's just allowing that designation 
of um, the additional 250,000 for the smallest communities in the state. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Senator. All right, I see, uh, are you going to able to take a question or two? Sure. All right, Representative Heath. Oh, thank you. And thank you, Senator, um, for taking my question. This has been a serious problem for many, many years. And for a place like Hearts Location, it could just um, explode their whole budget. How will they be able to get their money within that school year and not wait till um, the following year? Is that what this bill does? Well, this would not, my understanding as representative, and thank you for the question, would not be retroactive. Um, it would have to be, and let me look at the effective date. I think, hang on, uh, uh, 60 days after passage. So assuming that um, we were to pass it this year, I think they would qualify for this in the next education funding cycle. Okay, thank you, Senator. Thank you, uh, Representative. And, and Senator Bradley, I do have one question. We have some communities that are a thousand residents or less, which uh, have a real uh, strong um, tax base. Um, some of the ski areas, for example, I won't say any names, uh, but uh, we also have communities uh, such as Monroe that uh, have a, a strong tax base. Is there any way that this uh, uh, amount that you're putting in here, the $250,000, would be earmarked towards the community which has the low equalized property valuation? Well, I didn't specifically try to design language to that effect. However, if you look at the way it's written, it says the state may designate an additional $250,000 of funds for any community um, to mitigate the impacts of special education costs when emergency assistance is necessary to prevent significant financial harm to such community. So I think you could make the argument that in a community that has a much more significant and robust um, property tax base, that it would not meet that standard potentially of significant financial harm. I think that's a better way of doing it than um, trying to, um, you know, set up an arbitrary number. Given that, you know, already the thousand or fewer residents is somewhat of an arbitrary number. Thank you. I, I think your phraseology does it. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Representative Tanner, you have one last question, and we're then going to let Senator Bradley get back to work. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Senator, for taking my question. I was just wondering how this affects small towns that are part of a cooperative school district and have a, a special ed student. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not certain of the answer to that. I think maybe some of the experts on... Uh, your committee might have a better idea of how that would work. I think it, um, I believe in the case of Hart's location, they are part of the, I can't remember the SAU number, but in the SAU with Conway and some of the other Northern Carroll County towns. And it's meant to help um, that community of Hart's location. So I believe that it would be targeted to that community. Thank you very much, Senator Bradley, and uh, have a good day. Thank you very much, and thanks for uh, considering this bill and for your thought on all of the omnibus bill. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we're, folks, we're going to go back to part one and take any testimony uh, regarding the federal student aid, FAFSA. So, uh... Looks like we have three people that want to testify. Um, Joe Atchison, um, I'm going to promote you. Let's go right ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Atchison. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? 
Yes, we can. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, my name is Joe Atchison. I'm uh, Vice President of Community Engagement and Lending Programs at the NEF Network, uh, speaking as a member of the, public, of the public on behalf of NEF today. And I wanted to thank the committee for having me on. Uh, we did want to, you know, just say a few things about um, this bill. Uh, my organization is, you know, remaining neutral on the bill, but we did want to highlight some of the great work that we do in the community and would like to you know, kind of represent how you know, if the bill were to pass, how we would be able to support you know, the rollout of this you know, across the state. Uh, if you're not familiar with NEF, you know, we are a Concord nonprofit uh, that has been you know, doing uh, a number of roles in the community for decades, you know, all related to higher education planning and financing. Uh, we do have a center for college planning you know, as part of our organization that has been around since 1995. And you know, does a number of outreach and activities, you know, all free to the public, you know, across the state of New Hampshire. Uh, we work closely with, you know, all schools, particularly public schools in the state, uh, as well as other community-based organizations to uh, deliver college planning workshops uh, and you know, information related to, you know, navigating the entire college experience from application uh, to financing and everything in between. Uh, the Center for College Planning team also uh, delivers free personalized advising sessions. Uh, in pre-COVID, of course, we were doing these in person. Uh, we are currently have adapted that model to you know, support you know, students and families with a virtual model for, that, for those advising sessions. Um, as far as the paths of trends, you know, what we have seen nationally is that um, as of early April, you know, FAFSA completion is down uh, about 6.7%. Uh, with New Hampshire, FAFSA rates uh, down 7.6% year to date as of early April. Um, in underserved communities and with low income school districts, we're seeing an even starker drop off you know, with uh, decreases of around 11%. Uh, as of April, you know, we are uh, in New Hampshire at a 48% completion rate for FAFSA uh, for this academic year. Uh, moving forward, you know, if this if this bill were to pass, you know, NEEF has the infra infrastructure in place to expand our services and, you know, support schools in the rollout of this legislation. Uh, we would we would work with our students and families to uh, reduce the strain and assist with making, you know, what is what can be a very overwhelming process, uh, less daunting to them as individuals. Uh, we do support, you know, the removal of all barriers, you know, for New Hampshire students in their pursuit of their higher educational goals and, and aspirations, career aspirations as well. And, you know, we do feel that we could, you know, greatly assist schools in this rollout. Uh, we, we, are on, we are in agreement with, the, you know, the amendment to align this with the 2023-24 school year, uh, which aligns with the FAFSA simpl simplification legislation at the national level. Uh, this would allow NEF to, you know, increase staffing levels as needed, you know, in support of, you know, providing greater support and resources to uh, the school community, uh, such as an additional training and professional development for school counselors that we work closely with across the state. Uh, we would also, you know, could also develop a informational and edu educational campaign to uh, help the general public in understanding, you know, the requirements of, of this bill. In terms of, you know, you know, and again, you know, I do want to highlight, you know, while we are remaining neutral, uh, we remain, you know, committed to, you know, um, any changes that welcome, you know, uh, FAFSA completion, uh, increased equity, you know, among student populations. And, you know, certainly we do not want to see, you know, students and families leaving um, money on the table at the federal level that could be available to them to, to assist in their higher education pursuit. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, are there any questions for Mr. Atchison? Mary Heath, yeah, Representative Heath. Well, thank you again, Mr. Chair. And, and thank you, Joe, for taking my question. One of the populations I've always been concerned about um, with regard to um, aid of uh, the foster children in our state. Um, is there a way to uh, especially reach out to them to let them know that something like this is available at this point in time, because I think it would be a huge asset for them. And, and thank you for taking my question. It's a great question. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, 
that example, I think is just one, you know, example of the, you know, some of the vulnerable populations that we seek to assist, you know, throughout our spectrum of services. So um, our advisors do work, you know, with, you know, foster children and parents and families today. Um, certainly, again, with this you know, proposed legislation, we could you know, incorporate that into part of our campaign. I think it, as an organization that is, you know, part of the concerns that we have in terms of, you know, students who are vulnerable, who may have a technology gap at home, who may have parents that are, you know, for, for any variety of reasons, you know, perhaps not fully participating in the, uh, in, in the FAFSA process or, or are not available to. Uh, so we would need to, you know, reach out to, you know, those vulnerable um, students and families, you know, I think of like in, students with incarcerated parents as well, and, you know, kind of let them know, and, you know, the, the bill does include a waiver, you know, for, for people to decline to pursue, to fill out the application. Uh, we certainly hope that most people would fill out the application and not, and not utilize the waiver, but uh, to your point, you know, it, it would certainly require an educational campaign and additional support. Thank, thank you very much. Further questions, uh, Mr. Atchison? Not seeing any, thank you very much. <clears throat> Next we have Joel Karstens. He's by welcome to education. Uh, he is US and H. Welcome Mr. Carstens. Thank you, Chairman Ladd. Uh, thank you, members of the committee. I appreciate your time and energy, and um, I'll try to keep my comments brief. Uh, as for the record, my name is Joel Karstens. I'm both the Director of Financial Aid at the University of New Hampshire, and I'm also the current President of the New Hampshire Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators, an association of financial aid professionals throughout the state um, whose sole focus at colleges and universities is to help students afford um, the, their college education. Um, today, I'm speaking on behalf of the University System of New Hampshire. Uh, as you know, over the next decade, our state is facing declining numbers of high school graduates um, and that smaller populations of high school graduates will likely have a different socioeconomic profile than historically um, uh, have been suggested by post-secondary enrollment uh, in the past. The next decade is also a time, as the committee is well aware, when the need for New Hampshire workers with post-secondary degrees and credentials has never been higher. And that uh, and that uh, need is increasing rapidly. It's not an option for New Hampshire to leave these students behind who both need the post-secondary degrees and credentials for personal success. And also the New Hampshire economy that requires uh, a strong environment future um, also needs those students to be, uh, or those uh, New Hampshire Granite Staters to be um, participating. So University System of New Hampshire supports efforts such as SB 147 to make the pursuit and attainment of post-secondary degrees and credentials part of a comprehensive and coordinated financial literacy strategy for New Hampshire. The U.S. Department of Education has announced uh, the free application for federal student aid will be simplified. Um, I believe you've heard that testimony from other members today beginning with the 2023-2024 academic year. Uh, anyone who's completed a FAFSA in the past 20 years knows that this is very good news, that the simplification process will benefit everyone. Um, and as a financial aid professional, I'm excited about this simplification and what this may mean for students and being able to submit a FAFSA in the future. Uh, but my 25 years of education finance experience tells me that this change will encounter issues both known and unforeseen this is gonna be bumpy on the federal side. So in the Senate, the university system and the NAHASFA members I represent as the association's president supported an amendment to the bill that would delay the implementation until the 2023 school year to align with this federal simplification. And we appreciate the Senate adopting this common sense change um, and that will allow New Hampshire Department of Education as well as the federal effort um, and public schools time to prepare and implement the necessary systems that will track these requirements at the state and local level. So as you can, as you know from this bill, this is going to put some pressure on both the Depart Department of Education likely, as well as the state and local level um, public school systems to track all of these different applications and whether students have met this high school graduation requirement. Delaying for a year gives those systems times to, those participants time to uh, appropriately be able to track um, and develop systems that will help do that. 
In summary, completing a FAFSA is a positive step that each high school graduate with post-secondary intentions um, and those who may be on the fence, particularly due to financial concerns, um, can take. Um, so the University System of New Hampshire is ready to continue our support of FAFSA completion and Granite Staters post-secondary education pursuit and attainment. Um, I'm happy to entertain any questions that the committee may have. Thank you, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Not seeing any hands up. Oh yes, Representative Luno. Thank, thanks very much, Mr. Chair. And, uh, and, and thank you, um, Mr. Carstens for, uh, for testifying this morning. Um, just a quick question. Um, you know, we, we, we just finished up with a bill, uh, Senate Bill uh, 44, where we talked about the, the uh, potential use in the future for uh, Pell Grants to, to help, um, you know, pay for workforce development, uh, you know, pro credentials for workforce developments. Do you have to fill out the FAFSA to qualify for Pell? Yes, you would. Um, so students would be required to complete a FAFSA in order to determine their eligibility for the federal Pell Grant. The simplified um, FAFSA form um, is going to boil things down to about 18 questions. Um, right now, there are about 100. So um, the simplification process, we think, dovetails very nicely with this requirement. Um, and we, we strongly encourage the House to, to also adopt that delayed um, implementation until the 2023-24 academic year when that FAFSA simplification will be available. Uh, that, that's excellent. Just a, just a quick um, a comment. I believe that delay is actually in the bill that we're, um, Fantastic. we're seeing, so it doesn't require further amendment to that. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. That's excellent. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Carson. Are there further questions? Not seeing hands. Thank you very much, Joel. Um, the, the next person I'd like to call, I, I think we have some technical support from the Department of Education available to us. Uh, it is uh, Diana Fenton there or um, yes, Steve I've promoted, Appleby? I've promoted Diana Fenton. Thank you. Good morning. I'm actually going to defer to Steve Appleby on this, but I look forward to speaking to the committee on part two of this bill. Thank you. Okay, I just have, I have a question for uh, Mr. Appleby. Steve, um, I'd like to ask the question that uh, currently, we have in all these high schools counselors with the responsibility of meeting with students to uh, prepare them for the next step following graduation from high school, uh, be it uh, uh, technical school, be it post-secondary, be it the military, etc. cetera. Um, the, the, the language in this bill seems to me that it's, it's a prerequisite to receiving a high school diploma would the possible option that if a child decides not to do this, uh, they may not have to. Um, I ask the question, why is this necessary? If we have counselors in the schools, why aren't they doing this as just part of the job that's supposed to be going on? Is Good morning, this, Representative. Is this legislation necessary? Uh, Steve Appleby. Division Director for the Department of Education. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I, I don't have a good answer to your question, to be frank. The, uh, you know, currently there are a lot of programs statewide where schools and those counselors work with students and encourage filling out the FAFSA. Um, I also know that um, the uh, me folks put on an, uh, an annual event to try and encourage this as well. Um, but beyond that, I, I'm not sure how to answer your, your question, Representative. Yes, Representative Cordelli. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Appleby. Um, the uh, legislation provides for a waiver um, if the family does not want to uh, fill out a lot of FISA form um, and that the waiver would be created by the Department of Education. Um, would the department also be responsible for uh, tracking uh, waivers versus um, 
for those who have uh, uh, filled out a, a FISA application. Um, FAFSA, I'm sorry. Um, would you be responsible for tracking those, those waivers? Good morning. Thank you for the question, Representative. If I understood you correctly, you broke up a little bit at the end. You're asking if we would be uh, also tracking those waivers. Did I understand that correctly? Yes. Yeah, um, I, I would assume where the department has granted rulemaking authority on this matter that we would uh, be the ones to track those waivers. Thank, thank you very much. Are there further questions for the department? Not seeing any. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, who else do we have? Somebody else to testify in part one? Who's got her hand raised? Deborah Skyer, and uh, she's not signed up to testify, but her hand has been up for a while. So well, part one, not fine. Then yeah. bring her up. She just lowered her hand, so she <laughs> moved on the list. Okay, so what we're going to do now? We're going to move into part two of this bill. Uh, part two of the bill. Okay. I got her back. She just right. moved all over the place. Okay. Got her back? Yeah. Go ahead, Ms. Skyer. Did you have a question for the committee or? Testimony. Testimony? On part one. Okay. Is that, is that better? Yes. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chairman Ladd, for the opportunity to speak on this bill. Um, relative to the student aid first section. I'm Debbie Skiri, and I serve as the president of the New Hampshire College and University Council located in, in Concord. Um, some of you may be familiar with NHCUC. Um, we're a nonprofit consortium of the public and private institutions of higher education in the state. And these institutions are recognized and highly regarded for their teaching, research, and community service activities. And I'm really here very quickly to say um, that college access and success is a strategic priority of the NHCUC. And we strongly support increasing the number of students attending college. We really feel strongly that attending uh, or attaining a college degree rather is an important accomplishment for students. It increases their earning potential as you've heard from several other folks um, who have testified today. Um, and then at the same time, while it serves uh, individuals, we also know that it um, serves our state in terms of our workforce development. Um, HB 147, um, sorry, that's SB uh, 147, seeks to require students to complete the FAFSA um, prior to high school graduation. And I think in order to encourage more students to apply and attend college, it's important to remove all the barriers, which the FAFSA has been previously and this would be an excellent step moving forward to serve the students and families of New Hampshire. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, uh, Deborah. Are, are there questions for the, the council? Not seeing any hands up. Thank you very much, Deborah. Thank you for having me. Okay, with that, we will move into part two. This uh, uh, regards uh, a central registry in the Department of Education to maintain records. Chairman Ladd, I did promote Ruth Ward um, since she was scheduled to testify on this portion of the bill. Uh -huh. I don't know if um, she's there now, but uh, Senator Ward, if you're there, please go ahead. Do we have any other testimony on this section? I would ask you to ask. Okay, are there questions. any members, attendees that have questions on part two of 147? If you have a question or if you'd like to offer testimony, would you please raise your hand? I see nobody. Uh, with that, we're going to move in to part three of the bill relative to transportation of pupils in, contract care, in a contract carrier. Um, do we have anybody from the Department of uh, Safety like uh, Elizabeth Balecki? Uh, 
DMV. DMV, B5. There she is, yes. Okay. Great, the director said. Good morning, um, good morning, representative. How are you? Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you just fine. Yes, um, thank you. And um, I do want to start out by introducing myself, Elizabeth Bielecki. I'm the director of the New Hampshire DMV. Um, I want to tell you that we're taking a neutral position on this, but we did work with Senator Khan on, on this request from him as well. And um, I'm hopeful that he gave you the background of what he was trying to do. And I'm, I'm hopeful that there are other speakers behind me that, that, that can really articulate the need and why they were working on this. Um, we do uh, oversee pupil transportation in the state, and I do have Sergeant Kelby with me who can answer any questions that you have about the transportation of students and our oversight and enforcement of that as well. Senator Khan identified a need for additional transportation for longer distances, and he worked with us to ensure that the two are pretty much tracking the same as far as the qualifications of the driver um, would be very similar to the qualifications that school bus drivers have to meet right now as far as background certification and training requirements as well. Um, he also delineated the difference between utilizing a school bus for school transportation to and from school. And this proposal inclu includes only transportation for school-related activities that will require travel of at least 75 miles. Um, so with that, I will stop right here and see if you have any questions that I might be able to answer. Uh, yes, Representative Woodcock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Director, for taking my question. Do you know, I, I couldn't pick it up from reading the legislation. Do you know if that 75 miles is total or one way? Um, I, I can only see what I'm reading as well. It says travel of at least 75 miles. I know in discussing with the Senator Khan, um, he looked at, at it both ways, whether it would be a round trip travel or one way, but I don't think the bill clarifies what his intent is with this. Uh, thank you, Director, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. This weekend, Representative Woodcock, I did have a call with Jay regarding that same question. And uh, it wasn't really defined clearly to me. I, I'm understanding it's 75 what miles each way. Okay. So it, it, for you, you know, it wouldn't be just 30 plus something miles <laughs> either way. So, okay. Are there, Thank you. Are, are there further questions for uh, Director Balecki? I, I do have one. Uh, Director, can you please explain to me if there's a different requirement for drivers that are driving, uh, uh, that are a contract carrier that ha are carrying uh, you know, more than 16 children do they have different requirements or do are they the same as they are for um, what we're using for our school buses going to and fro uh, to school? Um, thank you for the question, Representative. And there, there are differences. And um, I know that Sergeant Kelby is also listening and perhaps he could raise his hand and, and he could really um, in, in a lot of detail explain that to you as well. But there are differences and um, licensing requirements, background requirements, and so forth. So I am not sure you if can... he was able to identify himself. Yes, uh, we'd like to hear a little bit more about the background checks and what has to be done for the driver and the contract carrier. Um, sure. I, again, I, I'm not sure if Sergeant Kelby raised his hand. I, I see him on right now. Yeah, I promoted him. Go ahead. Welcome, Sergeant Kelly. Kelby. Hello. Yes, we can hear you, sir. I'm having some, I'm having some internet connectivity problems. Um, I apologize. Uh, you wanted to know the background on uh, uh, motor, car motor coach drivers as opposed to school bus drivers, sir? That's right. The background check. Yes. What are there different requirements? Or are they are they similar for the two for your, your regular so, school bus driver going to and from school, taking the kids to and from school? 
versus the contract carrier that may be doing one of these field trips uh, 75 miles each, each ways. And are they the same background checks for the driver that's driving the bus? Uh, under current legislation, the uh, any anyone transporting children to and from school or school related activities under current state law 25996 uh, states that all drivers uh, need to undergo a criminal background check, motor vehicle background check, uh, minimum training, um, and the names have to be submitted to a roster um, to the state of New Hampshire, the Department of Safety. That's outside of the requirements for Department of Education. So to answer your question, uh, yes, currently, well, actually, no, currently, if you're driving a school bus, be it a charter uh, school bus or a home to school fashion school bus, you're a school bus driver. Um, that means you, you, you have to have a minimum amount of training, undergo all the criminal motor vehicle background checks. Um, for motor carriers uh, like Concord Coach, under current law, they are not allowed to transport for a variety of reasons, and they are not uh, currently required to undergo uh, motor vehicle criminal background checks or have minimum training. So uh, it's important to note that the legislation, which I still have not seen, um, I, I don't have a copy of that legislation, unfortunately, so I can't weigh in one way or the other. Um, under under uh, the proposed legislation, as it has been verbally explained to me, uh, the motor coach, like a Concord coach driver, uh, would undergo a certification to be a school bus driver. But again, I can't, I haven't seen that. I, I don't have a copy of that legislation. Um, so, so, uh, I really can't answer uh, anything relative to the proposed legislation. And, and Representative, I'm sorry, this is Director Bielecki again. Um, and I can add that the proposed legislation would actually, um, um, bring into the scope for contract carriers or motor coach drivers would, would bring them into the scope of what's currently required of the school bus drivers. So the third section of the bill where it says that um, they would be subject to the uh, requirements for training and criminal background checks required under RSA 18913A, those are the background checks required by the Department of Education. And then um, it continues on to say as well as school bus driver certificate requirements under RSA 26329, that would bring them into the scope of the requirements that current school bus drivers are required to complete. Thank you for, very much for that clarification, Director and Sergeant. Uh, Representative Leon, do you have a question of either the uh, Sergeant or the Director? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a question of the Director. Uh, would this extend this, these school bus requirements to all drivers for a business like Concord Trailways if they do some school business, or would that only be for those, those drivers who are approved for school trips? Um, thank you for the question, Representative. The way that the bill is um, currently structured would be any drivers that would be driving kids um, for school-related activities would have to meet those requirements. If, you, if, a, if a motor coach company has drivers that would not be participating in those type of related activities, they would not be required to meet those um, minimum standards. Thank you. Representative Tanner, do you have a question? Um, my question was very similar to Representative Leon's. Thank you. Okay, so you're good. Are there further questions of the DMV or our, our sergeant? I don't see any. Thank you very much to both of you for, you know, helping us out here. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We have Diana Fenton from the Department of Education who would like to testify. Good morning. Good morning, Hi. Diana. I apologize. I'm testifying from the woods of Mount Vernon and I keep losing my connection. Um, so with the committee's permission, I'd like to testify as to part two. I think I missed my opportunity and I appreciate being able to circle back a little bit. Um, Part two would simply give the Department of Education access to the records maintained by DHHS, their central registry, um, 
when we are credentialing first-time applicants. Members of the committee might be familiar with the bill that was passed last session, which allows the department to do a criminal background check on first-time applicants for a teaching credential. This bill, Senate Bill 147 Part 2, would expand the department's ability to have access to the DCYF registry. It occurred to the Department of Education um, and our partners at DCYF that if DCYF has flagged an individual who they believe should not have access to children, uh, DOE is of the position that that individual should not be able to gain access to children via the Department of Education. Um, and we look forward to working with our sister agencies so that we are all on the same page. Uh, I will share with you that we had this situation occur um, on an individual from the state of Massachusetts who was on the Massachusetts list um, of DCF. They have a different version, but their version of DCYF. Uh, that person was on a list in Massachusetts of not being able to have access to children. And they came up to New Hampshire and became credentialed to teach in New Hampshire. So we was made aware of this situation and we have worked closely with our partners at DCYF um, to craft this legislation. DOE has an individual, um, a position that can take this role on so it will not be of any additional cost, we do not believe. And as DCYF changes their system of their central registry and makes it electronic, uh, we think that access will, will be even easier to address. Uh, I appreciate your time and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. So uh, Diana, th thank you very much. So uh, this part two has been put together by the department, is that correct? It has been put together uh, by the department in conjunction with our partners at DCYF. I worked with attorney Rebecca Ross. This was a joint uh, venture. And so we, we crafted this language together. Yes, that is correct. Okay, going on to part three, because that's where we were, when we backed up a little bit there. Understood, um, thank you. Yeah, you, you're more than welcome. Um, does the department have any issues with part three? Uh, no, we do not. We had some questions that have been addressed uh, concerning the clarity of the language about the 75 miles. Um, but in terms of the background checks of uh, school bus drivers, um, that is a function that the department is currently working on getting up to speed on based on pending legislation. We're working on our work with our partners at the Department of Safety to get that um, fully effective. Um, so no, the, the department doesn't have a position on part three of this legislation. Thank you, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes, Representative Woodcock. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Attorney Fenton, just going back to your response on the 75 miles, you said you had an explanation for that. We don't have that, at least I don't have that from the last couple of questionnaires we've asked. Can you tell us is the interpretation of 75 miles one way or round trip? Uh, thank you for the question. We didn't have any additional information. I was just look at, listening to the previous testimony. Okay. I will okay. just look back at, at my notes. Um, and I believe it was understood to be 75 miles each way rather than yeah. a, a total. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. I, I think that's what the intent of Senator Kahn was. That when I talked to him and he was out in Chicago, uh, he was referring to 75 miles in a direction. So that has to be each way. Uh, Attorney Ladd, I mean, Representative Ladd, uh, the reason I was asking that was more on that one little line in that paragraph that talks about special education activities. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the bulk of the, the area is special events, after school lights, those types of things. But there is one little small three or four word disclaimer about special education. So I just, my thinking was, is this going to run into a new way to transport youngsters who are special ed youngsters um, during the day for activities or events or, or therapies? That was the 75 piece. So that was the intent of my questioning. Thank you. Yeah, and that might be something for Attorney Fenton to look at too. When you're starting to talk special ed, you're starting to get in a different domain altogether. Thank you. Yes. Uh, are there any further uh, folks that want to test? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Attorney Fenton. Yes, we have um, we have Tim Brewer. Uh, welcome to education. Brewer, R-U-E-H-R. 
number two. Uh, good morning, Mr. Rubin. Hello. Hi. <laughs> yes, we can hear you. And are you prepared to speak on part three? I am. Um, I am the CFO at uh, Keene School District, SAU 29. We have uh, seven districts here. Some are small, Keene being the largest. And I've been here for 20 years in uh, doing this work. I wanted to give a little background, although many of you may have know this. I was surprised to learn uh, that although it's a common practice throughout the state, especially in our athletics for long haul trips, using a coach motor coach bus is illegal to transport students currently in the state of New Hampshire. Although if you've been to your, your kids games or your grandkids games, you'll see these coach buses rolling up everywhere. In fact, your student may have gone to DC or Quebec or the Museum of Science on one of these buses um, as mine have. Uh, and the Department of Safety, uh, Director Bilecki and uh, the Sergeant have been incredible uh, resources. So when I found this out a couple of years ago, I of course uh, shivered a little bit knowing that if one of these buses had an accident, that not only could I be liable, but my towns and districts would be extremely liable. How would they defend themselves putting students on a mode of transportation that is currently illegal? That's what's happening right now. I've called private companies. It's still going on today. They aren't rostered. They aren't background checked. And they're driving our students on buses that aren't approved by the state of New Hampshire. So I went to Senator Kahn, who's worked tire tirelessly to try to address this situation. Um, so the first reason was the liability. The second, Department of Safety will tell you, and, and I, I agree 100%, that the safest vehicle on the road is a yellow school bus. But there becomes a, a sense of practical, you have to be practical. Uh, a yellow school bus driving kindergartners and first graders on a two hour trip should have a bathroom, for example. A football team needs storage, if you've seen in a hockey, for the amount of gear they have. Our football team would have to travel in three school buses for one team, that doesn't include uh, JV, to go to a, an away game in Keene, we're often two hours away. I agree that the intent is one way, 75 miles. In fact, I, recently negotiated a new contract where my provider, my school bus provider pays us back $500 every time we use a coach bus uh, that's over 90 miles. Um, we wanted coach bus simply for long haul. We're not trying to take business away from school bus companies. We want it to be safe, but you have to be practical. You're going to Washington DC, you're not taking the yellow school bus. You're driving to Berlin, I talked to a business administrator today who told me, I said, why are you still doing this? You're at great risk. He goes, I'm not putting my students on a yellow school bus for two and a half hour trip. It's not happening. So we're just risking it. So this is an important issue. Um, and and I, I really thank you for listening and considering uh, solving this issue because to most people, it's a small issue. But to me, when my reputation's on the line and my district's liabilities on the line and student safety. We need to address this sooner than later. Um, it's a real issue. I appreciate it. Thank you very much uh, for the information. That's uh, good stuff. Uh, are there questions? I don't see any hands up. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. So at this point in time, we're gonna go into part four, the last section in this particular bill which we've already had uh, our Senator Bradley inform us to what it's all about. Um, we will have, uh, are there any folks there to testify on part four? Oh, yep, there is Mr. Uh, Peter Currow. He's with the Londonberry School District.
Welcome to education. Am I good? Yes, yes we are. can hear you. Yes, Peter. I'll be brief. Um, everything Tim said um, is true. Um, I'll tell you, Londonderry, for example, we have the, the Lance of Marching Band. Um, any long trip is used uh, on, a, on a coach coach bus now. Um, the number one issue he brought up was, um, I believe many of the school districts have a week or, or half a week trip to DC. Um, and we, we'll line up somewhere around 11 coach buses to take the kids from obviously Londonderry in, into DC. We'll also use coach buses on, um, for any long field trips, field trips or athletics. Um, we gotta remember, in no way does this, are we talking about using coach buses for the regular transportation of students from home to school, school to home. There you are required to have the yellows. And remember, the yellows are there to control the traffic of the road. When you're doing athletics or activities, you don't really need the yellows. There's no traffic, there's no road traffic to control. The bus pulls up to the, to the building, students load, and, and of course, every, every school district has a policy on how many chaperones or coaches are gonna be, you know, are required if it's a field trip or we're a team. So there are adults always on the bus there's no road to cross, no traffic to control. They get on the bus, they go to the destination, they get off the bus with the chaperones and coaches, do their thing and, and, and come back. Um, there's there's, there's a, often um, VAs are pulling the hair out all the time, trying to juggle how to get kids to and from home and school in the afternoon and dealing with all the field trip requirements and all the athletic events that go on. Um, so allowing legally, uh, because it, it, it does go on uh, now, um, this flexibility or another tool for districts to use, especially on long trips, uh, really helps us out um, immensely. Uh, and before I leave, there's two things and then I'll, I'll be done. I know you got a lot of work ahead of you. Someone on the line and not, not, not this year, but the chairman can make a note or someone make a note. We got to address the issue of a statewide roster of school bus drivers. I'll give you a perfect example. For the most part, I always say the most part, I never say oh, wait. there are two big school, school bus companies in the state, STA and First Student. London Dairy has STA, Dairy has first student. So let's, I'll just use an example. We're out of bus drivers, we're out flush. We got the middle school softball team has to go somewhere, wherever, wherever they need to go to. Why couldn't I use a first student driver from Dairy who's rostered, certified, licensed, everything with the state? Right now I can't because Mrs. Jones is not rostered with the school district of Londonderry, even though she has all the certifications and licenses, whatever. So it's somewhere on the line, somebody could, could look at addressing that if you're rostered, if you're licensed, if you're certified to be a school bus driver and another district needs for whatever reason, why couldn't Londonderry in this case hire Mrs. Jones from um, for a student to take the middle school team to whatever they're going. Um, I'd like, you know, someone could take a note, maybe we can come back to that next year and, and, be, and maybe address that. Before I leave, uh, Mr. Chairman, on part four, you asked a question about, um, you know, well, we're talking small school districts, but some of them have a healthy tax base. If you look, and just think, just, just a suggestion, if you look on the Department of Ed webpage, there is a table that talks about the average assessment per student, and then there's a state average, 
and then it has the average assessment per student by each district. So you may want to use that as a guideline, something along the lines if you're lower than the state average and you're a thousand students or less, that may help you qualify to your point about you know looking at the tax base of the of the of the um, school district and and not just the population. That that's kind of the crux. For those of us who have been around here too long, that was kind of the, the basis of the Claremont 2 decision where, you know, how hard does the tax base work to supply the cost of education? Just a suggestion for you. I, I took a note when, when you were talking about that part with uh, Senator Bradley. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. I appreciate your information here. Um, are there questions for- Senator, uh, in uh, Representative Wood Representative Woodcock, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Carroll, thank you for taking my question. Um, in your testimony, you indicated that most school districts, particularly ones of your size, they have a requirement for a large number of corporate carriers like to, to Washington or, or trips to marching band with equipment or football, um, that they have their own protocols and they understand that. In your protocols in Londonderry, do you have a requirement for background checks of those drivers? No. But, okay, so you're you know using but, but you know what that, that's a good point and I may have to um, uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna look into that I appreciate thank that you. thank you thank you mr. chair thank you are there further questions for mr. Curl not seeing hands up thank you very much thank you we have yes yes we have a panel, a uh, member of the public, another panel, a uh, public member? Yes. Paula, Paula <laughs> Leslie. Okay. Yeah. Hello, Miss Leslie. Welcome to education. Good morning. Good morning. Um, sorry, I'm I'm down here in the corner in Westmoreland, New Hampshire, so I have a little bit of internet problem. So if I leave you, I apologize. Um, I have been a manager of Laidlaw and then first student. And over the years, I've been in the business 30 years. I now own a little school bus company, DNL Transit. And as Laidlaw and first student, we have had to use our area coach companies um, on these long trips especially due to the age old driver shortage. Um, in the early days, I did not know the whole piece of um, that we really weren't supposed to be. Um, the schools requested it, we would book it until in later days we had to stop that. Um, but the purpose these coaches serve, as Tim stated, as uh, Mr. Curio stated, with um, being able to put all their possessions underneath safe so they're not projectiles on our big school buses, trying to secure these items is very hard. Um, also, when you don't have enough drivers, being able to get the coach buses to be able to take um, a large group. So as Tim stated, we don't have to utilize three of our drivers to do one trip is huge. Um, I know in our area, we utilize Thomas and Wilson bus and both of them, their drivers do go through criminal background checks. However, they're not as yearly and, and as extensive as, you know, our school bus drivers. I would worry in this area, at least that, that our area coach providers would they be able to find drivers that would be willing to go through all the ins and outs to get their school bus certificate? That that could be a problem, you know, trying to trying to find that for you know this these schools. Quite often, the schools when their teams make it to playoffs, it's kind of an added little boon to put them on a a coach instead of a school bus, um, and you know that. These are all reasons I would be for this bill that I think um, the coach buses have a purpose as well as our big yellows. 
don't get me wrong, I, as Tim stated, I don't think there's anything safer than a big yellow. Um, but I also think that the coach buses in their drivers, sometimes I had drivers that went and drove coach buses. So they're um, all about safety. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula. Are there questions for uh, Ms. Leslie? Not seeing hands up. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you. You're welcome. So with that, we're um, done 147. Uh, do you have any numbers for us on how many Mr. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, I had a question earlier on part four with the special education about what happens in cooperative schools. And I was kind of waiting until somebody from the department or um, somebody else, uh, because uh, Senator Bradley said to wait <laughs> To, to answer that question. Do you know if that's in a cooperative school where you have, because we're not basing this on the number of students, we're basing it on the number of residents of the community. Um, if you had a cooperative district, some of them have these very small towns drawn in and how that's gonna work out. I, I think that what we have, Representative Tanner, is a good question that you've asked uh, that we should, we're not gonna be executing anything today that we have the opportunity to call over to the special ed department and to the folks at DOE and get a, a response to that for you. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. Am I been out, I've been unmuted. Um, well, we're, we're, I... we're looking at possibly Mark, what's Mark's last name? Magnella. Magnella, yeah, but he's in finance, so I, raised his hand. Okay, so let's see if uh, he has any kind of help for you here on that question, Representative Tanner. Can you? He's here. I'll second. Oh, I can, there, I can, hi, Mark. Hi, Representative Vlad. Um, how are you doing? So, so um, adequacy, um, Mark Manganello with the Department of Education. Um, with adequacy, it's based on, it's driven by the municipality, but the way um, special education aid, aid goes out, it goes out to the school district. So it would be going to the cooperative. There's your answer, Representative. So there, there as a follow-up, Mr. Chair? Yes, go ahead. So there would be no um, relief for a small town that happened to be part of a cooperative district? Or would the cooperative district uh, see some relief because that small town is part of it? Um, yes. Um, so the, this, the community is part of the cooperative, so the cooperative shares that burden. Um, they, they educate that student, and so they would see the relief. But yeah, that's that's um, it's not targeted for that particular municipality, but it is targeted towards the school district that is responsible for that student. That help you out, Representative Tanner? I I think it's still unclear to me, but uh, hopefully we'll get. It's some still more unclear to me also, and I think we need to get a little bit more definition from the department. Uh, Rep. Lay, he had his hand up. Rep. Lay, did you have your hand up? I did. I mean, I basically it was the same issue. I mean, I have near me and in my district a very small town of Roxbury, um, and but Roxbury is part of a much larger cooperative district. Would Roxbury, as a very small town, be eligible for this additional aid? That's a question we need answered. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's what Representative Tanner was also asking. It is, it is, yeah. yeah. So we will, and, and Mark, if you hear that from us right now, you might pass that on and try and get some resolution for us over at DOE. Will do. Thank you. Okay, with that, we're gonna close uh, uh, Senate Bill 147. Uh, what, what are our numbers there? All right, well, Rep Shaw's gonna have to Double check my numbers. I have 12 in support, zero opposed, two neutral. Yeah, I have them divided up by parts. That's all right. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. So we have uh, 148 in front of us. It was supposed to start uh, about an hour ago, but uh, I think it's important we get all the testimony and answers to these questions done properly before we move on to the next bill. So here we are with 148. I'm going to start this out and um, 
this bill does have more folks that are interested in it than we've had previously. Um, so uh, we're gonna start it out, uh, but we may have to take a break somewhere along the way here for a lunch, depending upon how long we go. Um, yes, uh, we have several senators that um, are participants in various parts within here. We have Senator Prentice for one, and we have Senator Ward. I don't know if Senator Waters, he signed up as well. Um, are any of those able to introduce this bill? Put your hand up if you are. Senator Waters. I've just promoted him and I'm trying again with Senator Ward. And Senator Prentice. <laughs> Uh, let's see, Senator Prentice. Go ahead, Senator Waters. Um, th thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. And I didn't know if Senator Ward was here to introduce uh, part one, and I don't know how you wanted to proceed on, on the various parts. Well, the way we're doing this, Dave, is that we are introducing the bill as a total, then we're wading through that by parts, part one, part two, part three, part four. For example, Jeb talked to part four of the previous bill. Um, well, 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 thank you. And um, if Senator Ward isn't here, I'd be happy to do this. Um, so um, Senate Bill 148 comes uh, to you with uh, five parts. It passed through uh, Senate Education 5 to 0 and uh, uh, through the Senate 23 to 1. Um, we endeavored, as with all these dreaded omnibus bills, and again, I apologize for doing this to you all. Um, but the vetting operation in the Senate was to try to make sure that anything that was controversial or would not be bipartisan was eliminated from the original bill. And so that's what we bring um, before you. And uh, if Senator Ward is not here, I can introduce part one. And then if you would let me introduce um, parts, uh, my, my two parts, uh, part two and part five, uh, one after the other, that would help with my schedule, but that's up to you. Um, that, that'd Jim. be fine, uh, Senator. What we did with uh, Senator Bradley introduced the bill. He was the only Senator hanging around at the time. And we let him speak to his part immediately. If you'd like to speak to your parts immediately, so then you can get on with other Senate business, that would be fine. Well, th thank you, uh, Mr. Excuse Chairman, me. members of the of the committee. Um, so I'll start with part two, if I may. Um, this has uh, to do Senator, with- Senator, can, can you just introduce the entire bill, get the entire thing on yes. the floor? I, that's what I thought I just did. I'm introducing okay. Senate Bill 148. I'm Senator Waters, District 4. <laughs> okay, part two. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Rolling right along. Um, so this bill uh, deals with career and technical Education. It was developed by the uh, Department of Education, uh, particularly Eric Froworth, who is the CTE statewide director, and I believe he is available for uh, questions that may go to him. It was also developed by the uh, CTE Advisory Council, which was established uh, a few years ago with Representative Ladd, who was a co-sponsor of this section. I do know that Senator Ladd has some ideas for some changes to this section on, on some language about the CTEs and I've, I've talked about those with him and I, and I support them. As far as this um, section goes, some of it's some housekeeping language. There is some policy to catch up with changes in the CTE system and dual concurrent enrollment. And then also some changes to, to um, catch up with the new Perkins law, which was implemented over the last a couple of years. So I'll try to go through um, rather uh, quickly, Mr. Chairman, given your, your time. Um, first off, we uh, had some definitional change there uh, on lines 27 to make sure that private school or homeschool are also included uh, by definition in the sending district. Um, then the next uh, part has, and you'll see this in several places in the bill, that we wanted to clarify um, that construction and renovation also included expansion or replacement when it comes to the cycle of funding for the CTE facilities. We've been on a 30 year cycle of construction and, and renovation of these schools. And in four years, we'll be turning the crank again to start that cycle over. So it was felt that we needed to be sure. I mean, some of these schools are so old, they might have to be replaced. Some are gonna, they're gonna be need to expanded, some just a little bit of renovation is gonna be uh, needed for them. So that's why 
um, that is there. Then the transportation issue uh, on page um, three, transportation and tuition has been uh, an area of concern for the CTEs. Um, I know Representative Ladd is much concerned about this as, as well, because we're afraid that over the last several years, some sending districts um, have begun to put a cap on a number of students who can get a career in technical education because the amounts of the transportation and tuition provided through DEE, DOE uh, did, did not meet the, the need. Now, I just wanna note, there is no fiscal note on this section because as always, this is governed by what ends up in House Bill 1 and 2. But it's aspirational here to say that it's important to budget the full cost of transportation. And of course, that will be determined by the budget writers. Um, and as we do now, whatever that amount is, it gets apportioned out. But this recognizes that issue that we're facing. And then there's just a little clarification about when the uh, reimbursement funds are distributed uh, to the schools. Um, you'll see uh, again some language on the construction and re replacement um, issue uh, that continues over the next um, page. And again, just, just clarifying some things about, about that and some uh, needed language changes um, there. Then on the uh, next page, um, and I'm now on page four, I mentioned earlier the um, Advisory Council on Career and Technical Education. If you're not familiar, this just a, it's just been a really terrific council. Uh, it has um, CTE directors, some legislators, uh, DOE, community college system, and then most importantly, business representatives. Uh, people from the various businesses and sectors that are served by CTEs are there to you know, advise as to what is needed for workforce development. Um, we felt uh, that there needed to be a high school counselor officially on um, the council. And uh, so that is what has been added, added here. Um, and then uh, we needed to stagger the terms of the members that are on that council as, as well. Um, then the next uh, part here gets into the issue of the, um, the rulemaking for the uh, career readiness credential. Um, some of you may recall we passed a career readiness credential, which could be fulfilled in, in a great variety of ways, including CTE uh, course taking. Um, and DOE came back to us and said they needed some rulemaking authority. And uh, this got caught up in the COVID last year. So that's why we um, put it uh, in, in here. Um, the next thing on page five is just that technical language change that uh, the, the new Perkins Act is called Strengthening Career and Technical Education for the 21st Century Act of 2018. So that's why that is, uh, that is here. Um, then the next uh, part on page five, um, some housekeeping to change the naming of uh, some folks who serve on the pre-engineering and technology curriculum and Pre-Engineering and Technology Advisory Council. So some language uh, clean up there. And then um, some more um, issues about, you know, catching up with legislative language and some policy changes that have been made. Um, this deals with a dual and concurrent enrollment program. And I, I do wanna say thank you, thank you, thank you House for restoring and increasing the funding for this program. It is, it is a smashing success. And if we're talking about career pathways and workforce development and keeping our students in the state and getting good jobs, this, this has just proved to be a great tool to do that. So students can, in dual concurrent enrollment programs can take classes that earn them community college credit and just save them so much money and give them a leg up on their, their work. So, um, an important thing here is that uh, we heard from the CTEs that you know the, the STEM having STEM courses eligible for this is is great, but there are other areas that really in career and technical education that aren't technically STEM courses, but certainly um, are valuable as dual concurrent uh, enrollment classes and would serve the function of workforce development in just uh, just the same same way. So that's why uh, that is there. And, and once again, there's no physical note because the amount of funding that has been provided or will be provided, we hope in the budget 
will determine how that gets parceled out uh, among um, various uh, needs for, for those funds. So um, that that's just opens it up a little bit. Um, then the next part on a dual and concurrent enrollment program, as you may recall, we added grade 10 uh, to CTE eligibilities, eligibility. So that is just added in there on line um, 24. Um, and uh, then the um, next uh, part here, um, bottom of page five, um, uh, asks the uh, co community college system um, and DOE to work together for the model dual and concurrent enrollment agreement that shall be used by um, CCSNH and a school district uh, to govern uh, that and uh, provide a framework for what is there. Um, and then some more language to uh, catch up with this, um, uh, the uh, career uh, readiness credential. Um, it just it would be an awfully good idea for high school uh, freshmen to have a conversation about how they're going to um, fulfill that, assess their student career interests. We've been working for quite some time to try to reach back into lower grades to get students interested in an earlier stage in career and technical education uh, and career readiness. Um, and this would be a, a good way to, to do that. Um, then finally, Mr. Chairman, on this section, uh, some of you may be familiar with the program we passed a number of years ago to establish a tax credit program for companies that want to donate equipment or um, have internships or company personnel uh, teach at the CTEs or supervise students who come out to the workplace. Um, it's been very successful. Eric Froworth can tell you a little bit more about how CTEs have grabbed on this to form sector of business uh, partnerships. And so um, since it's working, we want to um, extend it out for another another few years. Um, so Mr. Chairman, I, I did it and I'd be glad to move on to part five if you'd like me to. Thank you very much for uh, going through part four there. Um, that's an important section of this film. Um, yeah, you, 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 you want to let's see part five. That's uh, environmental outdoor outdoor. Yeah. yeah. Um, Perhaps what you ought to do, uh, Dave, is just briefly go through it like you did with me on the horn the other day. I will do that. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and, and the committee too. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, bring this um, before, before you. Um, so this bill uh, addresses the importance of um, outdoor education, but particularly this is a workforce development bill to deal with the outdoor recreation as just such an important part of uh, our economy and, and everybody thinks of the North country, but really throughout out the state. And um, so there's a lot of language in the first part of this bill which is just finding. So it doesn't go into state statute, but it, it's important to list here why for New Hampshire, particularly, um, you know, education about, about the environment, which can lead to careers in forestry uh, or, or forest ecology, water ecology, um, um, fisheries, marine science, and so on. And then also for outdoor recreation. These are important parts there. Um, and for me, uh, having been on the Fish and Game Committee when I was in the House, I wanted to emphasize that fishing and hunter education courses are also important parts of that um, education. Um, this bill is also very timely because um, Commissioner Caswell has now funded uh, the um, Office of Outdoor Recreation in the uh, BEA. Um, and Scott Crowder, some of you may know, has uh, been appointed to that position. This is something that was called on um, by the Granite Outdoor Alliance, which was formed a few years ago by um, the BEA, a lot of private businesses, uh, and um, uh, Senator, Senator Bradley. And uh, so they've been, you know, champing at the bit for this office to get, get funded. And um, so some language here um, supports that, wants it to work with our, our schools and uh, potentially to work with a national organization that is the, the, the 17 or so states that uh, have this office have a, um, a, a kind of cooperative agreement that could be looked into as, as well. Um, 
So to get to the heart of the bill, starting on line 33, uh, it asks the Department of Education to take the existing model curriculum uh, developed back in 2006, uh, endorsed by the Board of Education a number of years ago and then updated a couple of years ago. So it's an existing curriculum and a bunch of teachers and educators who are interested in that. And um, so what it does is say that the Department of Education will work with that, that group and to give to the schools um, so that as they look to develop these, these programs, they got some great examples and some uh, models to, to use. Um, then, uh, and Mr. Chairman here, um, I wanna mention that I sent uh, you an email and um, to the committees uh, with a Word document last night. Um, Representative Ladd and I talked last week about the fact that um, the uh, Senate had passed this bill, which has some criteria for adequate education changes. And of course you've, you've passed and the Senate has uh, passed out of the policy committee, um, Senator Ladd's bill, House Bill 242, which also uh, changes the criteria for an adequate education. So what I did is I went into this bill and basically took what is in House Bill 242 and uh, deleted what I have in these criteria um, three, six, and, and uh, uh, seven, and um, grafted in the language from House Bill 242, so we get conformity there. And then uh, uh, upon the discussion with Representative Ladd, it seemed as if it would make sense uh, to add from this bill, um, where it says knowledge of the biological, physical, and earth sciences and then say, including environmental science, which is naturally where it would be, uh, to enable them to understand and appreciate the world uh, and the engineering, socioeconomic, and geopolitical language uh, challenges around them. And that, that's all Senator, uh, Representative Ladd's um, language. And then uh, same thing on uh, criteria Roman six, the sound wellness and environmental practices. Um, using Representative Ladd's language, sound wellness and environmental practices, including outdoor recreation to enable them to enhance their own well-being as well as that of others. And then in Roman seven, um, skills for lifelong learning, including interpersonal environmental education skills and technological skills to enable them to learn, work, communicate and participate effectively in a changing society. Um, I know Representative Ladd, you, you may have some other ideas about how to do that, but um, you know that's just the point is I think we do need to conform these bills so we don't have a, have a conflict. Um, and then lastly, uh, let me note that the, you're gonna be perhaps hearing a little later from some folks who are developing um, community college uh, and uh, high school programs and outdoor recreation, a great group. And um, this section here, Next, uh, ask the um, uh, CTE director to report to the advisory council on career and technical education uh, about programs in outdoor recreation and potential for new programs at the CTEs. Now, why the adequacy um, changes and why this section are important is that we've been told that we really need to have somewhere in our statute, Tory language, some credit or credentialing for these programs, if students are going to be able to use them to get those jobs or to go into um, programs at the uh, community college university level. So that there needs to be some recognition here for that. And that's what the bill uh, tries to do. So um, Mr. Chairman, I, I sure hope that was no longer than what we, you and I had talked about before. <laughs> and it, uh, it gets out what you need out, out there on this part. Well, thank you very much, uh, Senator Waters. Um, there's a lot in here. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go on with further testimony. Uh, there may be some questions for you that you know, before you escape from us, uh, would you be willing to take any questions from the committee? I would be happy to. I have a, I have a meeting at 12, but I can you know, toggle back and forth. So I'm, I'm happy to, um, you know, to, I'll, I'll answer some questions now and then I, I can keep one ear attentive. So if some come up later after others have testified, I'll be I'll be there for you, uh, Representative. Thank you. Well, Representative Leon, you have your hand up. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Waters. 
My question is on the beginning of part two, where it includes children and students in private school and homeschool in the sending district. Does yeah. that create a f uh, financial obligation on that sending district? Um, they are they already have it. It just clarifies it. Um, it, it you know th that the sending district um, is responsible for its students that go to the receiving district, and um, a lot of homeschool and um, charter school and other students uh, do take CTE programs. And so we just wanted to make sure that the language is basically, this is just an update of the language to make sure that they're included in the definition because this language is from quite a few years ago before there was much legislation around either of those. So uh, Eric Froworth will be here to fill in some more detail on that, but um, it's just it's just acknowledging uh, those schools and, and the importance that CTE education is for students, um, you know, whatever form of education they're getting in the state, they ought to have an opportunity here. Um, thank you, Senator. I'll follow up um, with him with the details. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Representative Tanner, you have a question? Yeah, uh, thank you, um, Chair, and thank you, Senator Waters. Um, mine was kind of around the same issue mm -hmm. uh, that <clears throat> homeschooler, as when I talk to my local superintendent and ask him how many homeschool students there are in our district, he says, well, about uh, such and such a number, but he, he really doesn't have a specific number. So for a homeschooled student that the district is then going to pick up the tab for, do they have to be registered with the local district um, in order to do that? Because how else would the district be able to budget, number one? Number two, how would they be assured that that student resided, uh, had the you know, resided in that district. Um, it, it just seems to me that it's uh, an issue that needs to be clarified more. Yeah, th th thank you, um, Representative, for your, your question. I, I agree with you. I think um, Eric Fowler will be able to do that. I do wanna note that, um, you know, I, I think it's less likely that a homeschooled student will be homeschooled outside of their, their district. You know, their home is probably in a district, but, for the private schools, it's just clarifying if a private school is actually outside of a district, but a student wants to take a CTE class, they ought to be able to do that. But where do, where do they live? Um, where It's where they live. And uh, and I think also just let's note that this the tuition and transportation funding um, that is provided from the state is, is meant to address this. So the sending schools get to send their students to the CTE. Representative Mullins, you have your hand up? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator, for taking my question. Uh, related to what you just said, uh, are we to assume in looking at this that transportation for private school and homeschooled students to the CTE would now fall on the sending district? Let's ask Eric Froworth about these because he will he will know how this is uh, this is done. A lot of these individual students um, do find their own way to the CTEs, uh, or maybe brought by there by a parent, or there's a lot of them can drive. So um, right, I'm I'm only asking uh, yeah. as a follow up, um, Mr. Chair, yeah. and a comment to Senator Waters. I'm only asking as. Um, a town that represents that oddity of not having the school within its boundaries. Um, our private school students, many of them go to, uh, I represent Bedford, but many of our private school students go to Nashua to school. And so the question for me would be, you know, are we, are they being transported to the CTE in Nashua? Or are they being transported to the CTE in Manchester? Well, if they, I mean, if Eric, they, will answer, Eric will answer that, but if they're in Nashua, they'd be going to the National C, the Nashua CTE. I, I mean, I don't know, but let, let him let him address these details. Okay. Uh, it's pretty think, obvious I'm not sure. <laughs> just to further complicate this conversation, I did have a discussion with uh, uh, Eric Froworth over at uh, the OE regarding this very topic, dealing with Manchester, Exeter, and Nashua. 
And I have uh, put together some amending language, which would basically say the student's resident district shall be responsible for providing transportation and paying the transportation costs and, then sh uh, and shall then be reimbursed from the state. If a student is permitted to self-transport, the student's resident district shall reimburse the student in accordance with rules adopted pursuant to 541A and shall then be reimbursed from state funds. Kids that are not driven by the school district at a rate of 10 cents per mile may transport if agreed by the sending district, the resident district, be reimbursed 25 cents per mile. That is in rule right now. And I think Eric will be addressing that. Uh, but we need to address, I think it's time to address that we have school districts, Exeter, Nashua, and Manchester, which are shipping kids from one high school to a CTE center not located in that high school. They are incurring transportation costs mm -hmm. that they're not getting any reimbursement for. We need to address this policy issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, and I think that, you know, that is the, the, the a section a little bit further along in this bill, and it's essential. I agree with everything you're saying, and I think it's an opportunity to provide the committee who want to, may want to provide some clarification around the questions that have been raised about the private or homeschool in this, at the same time. So I think that that can get all done together. So uh, if we don't have any more questions, uh, um, Senator Waters right now, we've jumped around a little bit and um, we we do have folks ready to talk on, on these sections here, but we have not discussed all the parts leading up to part three yet, where we haven't talked about part one and part two. Um, okay, Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, I did promote Mr. Crowler because he raised his hand during that conversation, but we also have Senator Prentice who has been waiting um, to speak as well. So I didn't know, choose part three. Okay, so I didn't know if uh, either of those would take priority. Well, let's, well, if we're, 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 we basically been talking about uh, part two here, the career and technical education. And, and where we're on that right now, we can come back to part one. I think part one is pretty much, uh, uh, eliminating the, doing it, it, it's language to make it current with what we're actually doing. Um, so um, part two, I think we ought to have Eric come up right now on this and he may be able to also uh, address some of the issues that uh, uh, Senator Waters has addressed and answer questions of the committee on and part three, uh, two. Additionally, if I can make it even more complicated, uh, Senator Ward dropped off the call earlier, but she is back now. So is what part is she going? To, because she, it's been introduced. No, it's been introduced. So okay. she okay. she's welcome to talk on a part that she wants to talk on. Okay. Uh, so I will see if uh, Senator Ward wants to speak first, and I'll go back to Mr. Crowler. That appropriate. Uh, I don't want to jump around these parts. Okay, so if, I'm sorry. If, if either one of those senators is speaking to the part we're on right now, with either one or two, okay. they're welcome to come in. If not, we, we're going to okay. wipe up this uh, part two. Okay, so Senator Ward, if you're listening, I have promoted you. Um, She's part one? Okay. We haven't been able to uh, connect with you, so if you're there. She's not answering. I'm sorry. Is she there? She's not answering. I, I can't understand it. So. Let, let's let's Eric, let's elevate Eric and bring him on and and just stay on this career technical education here. Get this done. Okay. And then then we'll move on elsewhere in the bill. Sorry for the confusion. Welcome back, Mr. Crowworth. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, for, the, for the record, I'm Aaron Crowworth. I'm the administrator of the Bureau of Career Development at the Department of Education. Uh, and I feel like I'm in an episode of Doctor Who in my TARDIS and I keep bouncing around. I'm not sure where I'm going to land. 
<laughs> oh, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for hearing this bill. Uh, uh, Representative Ladd and the committee, um, I know we've been working on this. Actually, we had been working on this for a couple of years and, and hit some COVID uh, bumps. So I'm glad to see it's back again. Uh, I'm hoping I can answer the questions that you've already brought up around the private school, the homeschool, and some of the transportation pieces. Uh, and then I, um, Representative Ladd and I have spoken about um, some edits that he uh, is going to be proposing. Uh, and I do have one additional um I guess it's almost an unedit. So I think we'll start first with your questions that you already had. So with regard to uh, the private school and homeschool question, which is a, sort of the first line right in here, in the current legislation in RSA 188, it defines a uh, sending district as a school district where a student resides who attends a regional center that is not within their home district. So if the law just said that, any homeschool, charter school, or private school kid would already be covered because regardless of where they go to school, their sending district is the school district in which they reside. When charter schools uh, sort of started growing in New Hampshire, for some reason, and again, this was before me, a line was added into this law specifically about what happens to charter school kids. And it was to let people know that if a kid went to a charter school, their sending district was not the charter school, but it was wherever the district was that they lived. And what we've discovered in the past couple of years is because charter school students were listed specifically, homeschool and private school students were almost being told, were in some instances were being told that they weren't listed in the legislation and they couldn't attend CTE and that their home district wasn't going to do anything for them. So we wanted to clarify the law by adding this. Now, a student in New Hampshire can attend any CTE center in the state if there is space, regardless of where it is located. So if say they live in Manchester, but they attend a private school in Nashua, they are welcome to attend the Nashua CTE Center if there is a seat available. However, their home school district, which is Manchester, would be the one that would be paying the 25% tuition. The other 75% is still coming from the state. Now again, notice I did say if there is space available. The way the distribution happens is each, each CTE Center has assigned school districts that belong, that belong to it. And there are proportioned seats based on the percentage of students who live in each of those towns and communities. So a homeschool is another great example. If a homeschool student lives in, Ma in Manchester and applies to attend MST in Manchester, they would be representative of, of the percentage of students from Manchester that can attend MST. So it isn't necessarily that man that a school district would have to budget extra for the homeschool kids. They've already accounted for the fact that they would be sending a certain number of students to the CTE center. Uh, but again, if a, if the student decide they live in they go to school in Nashua and want to attend that center, if there is a seat available because it wasn't full, they can be accepted and attend there. I hope that helped. Okay, uh, can, we, can we take just a short break here, Eric, on where, you, where we're going with this? Sure. Uh, Senator Prentice is trying to get in quickly. I oh, okay. she's, she's got to get on some other things, and she we have her elevated in here right now. Senator Prentice, can you hear us? I, I certainly can, uh, Representative Ladd, and, and thank you. Um, thank you for taking time out to uh, let me testify today and introduce um, Section 3. Um, of 148. So um, your members of the House Education Committee again, well, I think we're into afternoon now, so good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sue Prentice. I'm the State Center from District 5, um, and I'm a co-sponsor of Section 3. And I'm standing in today for um, Senator Gannon, who represents District 23, uh, again, to introduce Part 3 of 148, relative to the emergency plans for sports-related injuries. Uh, by way of background, I'm a longtime paramedic, and I actually started my medical career as a student athletic trainer, uh, both in high school 
and in college. So I have some background in actually working on emergencies in an in, in academic athletic setting. Okay, currently a gap exists with emergency plans to respond to serious or potentially life-threatening sports-related injuries during school-sponsored activities, specifically for athletes in the public and non-public school settings that offer athletics for grades four through 12. Section three of 148 updates our current law that was written in 1971. I was in the first grade. Um, and this rela is relating to policies adopted by local school boards for the purposes of providing immediate and adequate emergency care for students and personnel who sustain injury or illness during school hours or during scheduled school activities. The Senate Education Committee amended the language to ensure that the emergency plans for sports related injuries is included in the school's overall emergency response plan and also moved the effective date to September 1, 2022 to provide districts sufficient time to develop an emergency response plan. These changes were unanimously supported by the committee and SB 148 was adopted on the consent calendar in the Senate. By updating the statute, this bill not only aligns with the best practices, it standardizes emergency plans for sports related injuries and illnesses, allowing each entity entity to be informed of the minimum standard of care athletes will receive. In addition, this bill promotes the flexibility for each school board to develop appropriate plans based on their geographic location, population, and district needs. It should also be noted that the proposed bill identifies that public and non-public schools shall establish procedures as part of their plan for athletes with a confirmed COVID-19 diagnosis to return to play, which is consistent with best practice and expert recommendations. In conclusion, emergency plans are a zero cost policy that incorporates the resources the school already has available and can be easily modified as the school accesses additional resources. I urge the committee to support section three of 148, Senate Bill 148. Um, there are athletic trainers and other stakeholders who support this. They may, they have been involved in drafting this legislation um, that may be here and can speak more directly up to the need and importance for a statewide baseline for emergency action plans for sports related injuries. I appreciate your time, uh, members of the House Education Committee, uh, Chair Ladd, and if I can answer any questions, I'd be happy to. Thanks very much, Senator. Now you see what these omnibus bills do to us. You know, they really mess with our minds. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is, uh, we find the, uh, the process um, challenging on the Senate side too, but just like all of us, we, we uh, must run through. Yeah, I understand, I understand. So what we'll do, we'll allow questions to you on this part, but then we're going to bounce back to part two and finish up the CTE stuff. Uh, are there quite a questions for uh, Senator Prentice? Representative uh, Tanner. Tanner. Representative Tanner, you have your hand up? Yep. Yes. Yes, thank you, Chair. And thank you, Senator Prentice. This is a much needed bill. Um, and I think uh, when you say emergencies for sports uh, related injuries, I'm hoping that this bill extends to practices. Oftentimes you have practices at odd hours and you know, as the coach, you're the only one there. Uh, and when you have to call for an emergency, it's good to have something like this in place. So uh, I hope it, it, the intent is not just at athletic events, uh, but also at practices and, and uh, recreation type events. Great. Uh, Chair, may I? Yes, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Representative Tanner. Exactly. Um, it's been my experience that the, you know, when you're having a game and there's a, a crowd and a plan and all these activities, things normally run pretty smoothly there. And, uh, but it, it is those off hours practices um, where you might have to travel a distance to get to a phone to actually call for help. And that's, a, that is, you know, part of what this, this proposal, this legislation wants to address is make sure that all is even regardless of whether you're in a game or not. If you have a plan and people know what to do, uh, we can we can save lives. And I've actually have seen that happen on the on the sports field. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you for bringing this forward. You are so welcome. Representative Woodcock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. 
for taking my question. Just, I understand it's sports related. Is there any thought to have this integrated with physical education uh, programs that are off site or at the far part of the site? Well, physical education programs, and then I missed the second part of your. That are at the far part of the campus, for example, fields and out far away. And it just seems to me that the physical education uh, emergency plan may be relevant. Uh, at, that's all. So it's, um, Chair, may I? Yes, go ahead. So it's a, a great cross question, Representative Woodcock. That should be integrated into the school's already emergency response plan uh, because that covers. I don't want to call it that. You know, well, it covers the, the day um, and all of the classes, courses that may be going on. This adds the athletic events, which right. are often off hours and sometimes even off campus. Uh, but we also made sure, as the Senate amended, to put this all in the same plan. So, yes, to your question, we're just adding this into that overall emergency plan. Thank you, Senator. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're so welcome. You. Are there further questions of the Senator? Looks like Rep. Tanner, Tanner. Tanner, is your hand up again or is it just not down? Uh, it's up again, uh, Chairman. <laughs> Thank you for recognizing me. I'm just um, wondering if there was any thought put in. Uh, Representative Woodcock kind of got my mind going about extracurricular activities that are not necessarily sports related. Um, theatrical groups that, that are practicing, you know, late in the evening. Um, the outdoor education groups, <laughs> we're mm -hmm. just talking about environmental education that maybe, uh, you know, wouldn't necessarily be part of the school's emergency plan, but uh, I know sports are probably a little more riskier, but certainly some of the environmental education has its risks as well. Chairman? Uh, yes, uh, I might add one thing for you, Representative Tanner, that if you look at RSA 193-1-C or 110-D-3, we are not using the word extracurricular. We're using co-curricular. Okay. And if you slice into that also intramurals, then you're covering all activities, whether it be theater, production, or some other activity that's not curricular of nature during the school okay. day. A co-curricular can even be during the school day. Um, but uh, I, we've been using co-curricular in all these areas, RSA, if we flip that in rather than saying athletic, because athletic is simply a part of co-curricular activities, I think we have a broader coverage here and be consistent with other forms of our, 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 our statutes. Rep, uh, Senator, do you have further? No, I don't. Thank you, Representative Ladd. And, and thank you, Rep, uh, Representative Tanner. Okay, what we're going to do now, because we we're, more, pardon me? We have one more question, I believe. Uh, did you have a question? I, I did have a question, uh, Mr. Sure. Chair, if I could ask. So yes, uh, Representative Moffitt. Uh, thank you, Senator, for taking my question. Uh, I'm just looking at how COVID-19 is specifically mentioned. And my, my question is, um, what about other contagious, infectious conditions? Uh, I'm just wondering if, COVID being mentioned, does that, does that cover similar contagious infectious conditions? Mr. Chair? Yes, go, go ahead. Yes. Okay, so Representative Moffat, thank you for the question. I'm going to need to confirm this, but it's my understanding that, I mean, COVID-19 is a new infectious contagious condition, uh, but schools have um, for, we're going to just consider all of, as Representative Ladd, I'll just point it out, we're going to represent this all as one package. They already have standards um, for, say, return to school and or return to play. So COVID-19 was added into this to take, you know, to take that extra step and make sure that um, it was added on, onto the list that already existed. Because you can't return to play, you can't return to school unless you meet a certain criteria for a number of you know, infectious issues. I can remember my daughter, when she was in school, if she had a temperature within 24 hours, she couldn't return to school. It had to be clear for that period of time. Sure, thank, thank you. You're welcome. Are there further questions of Senator Prince? I think we're done with the questions. 
it's great to see a representative lad and everyone and i appreciate your uh your time this thank afternoon you. okay thank you very much and i did enjoy hanover the other day well, well well good i'm glad you got there safe and sound all right perfect you're, you're welcome all right bye Okay, what we're going to do is we're backing off to Eric on, on talking about the part two, the CTE. I think we're going to try to get through this part, and then we're going to take a, a break for lunch. We many of us been sitting here, and uh, it's we need to stretch these legs. So, Eric, uh, could you please continue? Sure. Th thank you, Representative, and uh, I will hopefully do this also very quickly. Uh, lunch, lunch sounds great right about now. Um, uh, with regard to the transportation question about uh, private school, charter school, and homeschool students, uh, those students actually have never been included in the transportation piece. Typically, the, the private school, the parent, or the charter school has been providing the transportation. The way the legislation is written, transportation goes from the sending school to the CTE center. And it, so unless the kid can get to, you know, if a kid is attending a uh, private school, uh, and lives in Concord and can get to Concord and you know, or you know can get to Bow High School and get on the bus because they're a Bow student and go to go to Concord. But I don't think that's ever happened. The charter schools, the private schools, or the parents of the homeschool students typically bring the students directly or they drive themselves to the CTE centers. Uh, but as as Representative Ladd and Senator Waters mentioned, what uh, some wording change that Representative Ladd and I worked on is to fix the problem for Manchester, Nashua, and Exeter uh, that rather than using the, the language of the sending school district, which, is, which would eliminate those three districts, we changed it to, I believe, the homeschool district is putting the transportation. So that will allow uh, Nashua to uh, apply for reimbursement between North and South and Manchester in between all of the schools that are providing to MST and for Exeter because they are the only CTE center not actually located where the high school is. Uh, so we did understand that that was a challenge. And uh, in this legislation, we're fixing it that it will no longer be 10 cents per mile per kid, but it will be the actual cost of the transportation because our schools were losing uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in transportation because they need to spend $750 on a bus for four kids and they were only getting reimbursed 10 cents per mile. Uh, so uh, we did realize that that, uh, that became a big burden. So, uh, so we did fix that piece. Uh, the only other note I actually had uh, was on page, now we need to find it, I'm sorry. I believe it is page four. Uh, as part of the construction piece, uh, in, an in, in the request in the editing of this bill, we'd asked to remove um, part F line two, where it says accepts students from sending schools. As we were discussing this with the construction in the committee, we were reading it to say that in order to receive funding for construction, a CTE center must accept students from sending schools we have three CTE centers that do not have any sending districts. And so as we were reading this, we, we said, well, now they're not gonna be eligible for the renovation funds because they don't accept sending students. Uh, after we, we all agreed and put this through, uh, Commissioner Edelblue interestingly read it differently. He said, even though, for example, Portsmouth, which does not have any sending districts, if a kid from Dover wanted to attend a program at Portsmouth because Portsmouth had one, Portsmouth would accept them. So they, by definition, are accepting a sending student. So if we, if we eliminated that in here, he was afraid that although nobody would do it, a school could go great, we've accepted all this money from the state and now we're no longer gonna accept students from sending schools. So I would respectfully ask that the committee remove our request to edit this section of the document. Okay. Representative Myler, you have your hand up? Yeah, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Eric, for taking my question. Sure. How does, I have two questions. If a school district has a certain quota, 
that they have uh, to send to a particular uh, CTE center. And now we're adding uh, private and homeschool students to this group. Mm -hmm. How does the school district determine who is going to be in that quota if they've got more students than uh, the quota would allow? Sure. Uh, great question. Uh, it is actually up the um, acceptance into a CTE center is up to the CTE center. So, uh, for, and I'll, I'll use Concord and Bo, uh, we, I use them all the time. Uh, Bo represents say 5% of the, the, the population. The way it's determined is student population within the town. And so let's say Bo represents 5% of the region. So when Concord does their allocations, they say there can be 5% five, 5 of our seats in all of our programs catered to students who live in Bow. Now, let's say that represents 75 seats. It's very possible that 110 kids from Bow fill out applications and send them to Concord. And that would include kids who are at charter schools and et cetera, but live in Bow and send them to Concord. Concord decides which of the 75 students actually fill the seats. So it's not up to Bo to determine who, which applications they can okay. and they send them all. So, so it's the CTA center that basically, basically makes the determination of which students are gonna participate. Thanks, yes. that's a clarification I didn't realize. Yes. Now the next question I have is that dealing with the transportation costs. Yes. That is, um, I know like in Hopkinton, for example, we've got a bus that takes students into uh, uh, the CTA center in Concord. Mm -hmm. How does that work if, in, I mean, does a student from a particular resident school district, do they then have to comply with what the transportation process is from that school district to the CTA center? Or does the individual have a right to get there however they want to get there. What, what's the procedure on that? Sure. So if, if they're attending, say, Hopkinton High School, if that's the high school they attend, then they need, then it's how their school district sends kids to the CTE center. Um, many of the CTE centers do not allow students to self-transport. They don't have the parking space for it. Right. The, that, which is why the school districts are providing buses and which is why the state is reimbursing the school districts because it's an out-of-pocket expense for a school district that they wouldn't normally expend. Uh, but there are some instances where uh, both the, the CTE center and the high school allow a student to self-transport. They have, in many instances, they have to apply. There has to be a specific reason for it. Uh, but in which case the student can self-transport and then they are reimbursed that 25 cents per mile. So just as a follow-up, if I may, one final. Let, yeah. Let's use the example of a, of a student let's say from Hopkinton, uh, that is going to uh, the Tilton School and a private school. Okay. And decides that they want to attend a program as part of their, uh, as part of their education uh, mm -hmm. at the Concord uh, CTA program. Mm -hmm. How does the transportation from a residential student at Tilton to then come to the, Con the CTA in Concord, how does that transportation work? So uh, it, you, you actually ask a phenomenal question. Um, we have, um, ne I've, I've never heard of, of that specific situation. Uh, I, I can tell you that anytime we have had a private school student or a charter school student or a homeschool student, they have self-transported, whether it is a parent okay. driving them or it's, you know, the school has a van that drives them. Uh, and uh, so we've never heard of, uh, of a challenge otherwise. Uh, we, we're happy to, to try to help figure it out, um, but so far it hasn't happened. Um, All right, thank you for that clarification. Yeah. Representative Woodcock. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Eric, thanks for taking my question. Just it's a clarification on simple CTE uh, protocol, which I don't know really the answer to, um, which I don't, I don't know a lot of answers. This is just another one. Uh, on the CTE piece, if a young, I, I'm from Conway, by the way. Okay. If a youngster uh, lives in Conway and wants to go to a CTE program, we have a school here that right. has a similar, say, uh, a robotics program that we have. Do they have the choice to go to a different 
uh, CTE or are they obligated to stay in the one they have? No, great question. They, they do have a choice. However, they will be an out of region student, which means that they would be the last one to get a seat in the program. So if they wanted to go to Laconia for the program in Laconia, for example, sure. once Laconia fills all of its applicants from its assigned regional centers, if there are empty seats, right now, if there's empty seats, students at Laconia High School typically fill those all those empty seats. Sure. But if there was an out of district student, they would then be the next one in line to fill those seats. Follow up, Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes, you may. Thank you. Um, Eric, to that, Question though, I lost you here. Oh, there you are. Oh, there, yeah, you moved. Did, okay. <laughs> to that question, um, would the SAU 9 where we live be responsible for transportation since we have that program in our, our SAU as well? Uh, no. Uh, because it is an out of region and out of. Um, you know, it's an, uh, it's not, the, that student is opting their own opt to go out of that region. So uh, they would not be obligated to pay for the student. Um, but again, um, the legislation we're putting in right now, there would ultimately be no out of pocket expense for the school uh, because they would be fully reimbursed for tuition rather than the 10 cents per mile. Okay. Uh, uh, but no, they would not be obligated because, uh, because the student made their own personal decision to go to a different school. Okay. Thanks again. I appreciate it. Thank sure. you. But thank you for bringing up great questions. <laughs> Eric, I think we need some clarification too, because you're saying fully full cost of transportation will be reimbursed. Uh, you presented the council several years ago, or even the commission that in FY20, uh, transportation costs that were reimbursed were $680,000, of which the actual costs were $2.6 million. Yes. So th this is going to end up with a, a significant increase in, in, in finances with what we're proposing here. Oh, uh, yes and no. Um, it moves the money from one column to another. Uh, currently there is $9 million allocated for tuition and transportation. The way the law is written, transportation is paid first and then whatever is left is divided by the number of students attending CTE to cover up to 75% of the tuition cost. So, yes, yes that, 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 that is correct, Eric, yeah. but that's just taking from one pot, there's still $9 million allocated each year. And we're, we're now going to take out of that and throw the tuition money, which is 75 25, over to the other side of the coin. So they're going to re receive, in, in actuality, the same amount of money. It's just going to be in different pots. And yes. but, they're going to, but they're not going to receive the full tuition amount. It, it, I see this. We're going to have to, if we're going to do full funding, we're going to have to fully fund the difference, which is about $2 million. Uh, I, I could not agree with you more, Representative. And... Uh, during the fiscal committee hearings, this was presented, uh, and that conversation did come up around increasing the TNT allotment by at least $2 million. Uh, and um, I do not know where that stands. I, I do not believe there was a motion to increase that amount, but that was the request. Well, I see Representative Heath here. Maybe she can help us out. <laughs> yes, thank, thank you, Chairman Ladd. Um, during our negotiations in Division Two about TNT, we actually wanted to raise it, um, but the question, I believe, from the DOE was that if we raise that amount in the level of maintenance of effort, you would have trouble meeting that in the following years. So that's why we ended up not increasing because we had talked about raising the TNT because we wanted to get it uh, funded to the level that it should be funded. Can you give me any information on that? Uh, the, and you are correct that that was the question to me was, uh, would this raise uh, the maintenance of effort? And I, I said it would, and it would raise the maintenance of effort in perpetuity. So the concern, that I, I understood that came back from finance was 
we would be putting the state in a position of basically requiring them to keep it at that new higher level moving forward. And the committee wasn't sure they could lock themselves into requiring a future budget to keep it at that new elevated 11 million, if I remember correctly. And so we, we left it at the, um, the rate that we had established initially for that reason, because we didn't want to um, cause a hardship in terms of maintenance of effort, to, you know, whether or not there was gonna be future funding. Um, but it, it's disappointing that we couldn't raise that level because I think there, there is an issue because it ends up getting prorated across the state. Yes. That is correct. <laughs> and that's, that, it's not helping. And then if we add Na Nashua, Exeter, and Manchester into the transportation pot, uh, obviously, uh, if we're going to maintain the policy that we all believe in, there's going to have to be some matching dollars to support that policy. Uh, Eric, do you have anything else for us on, on, on this, these changes? Um, I don't. Uh, I just th thank you all for for bringing all these changes forward. And I, I said I do know you and I spoke that uh, that you have a couple other um, technical edits to put in, which I appreciate. Okay, thank you. We'll deal with those later. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Um, and I know uh, I'm going to be leaving as well. So uh, just to let you know, with regard to the outdoor rec piece, uh, CTE is already working on the inclusion of outdoor, outdoor rep, uh, recreation management as programs and competencies within our programs. So, um, so the request that's in the legislation for us to present on it in 2022, we will not have any concerns with meeting that obligation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Eric, and have a good lunch. Thank you, you all too. Yeah. Uh, do we have anybody else that wants to talk on this part? Because uh, the other parts we're going to have to wind up a little bit after we. I do not see any hand raised. Hands raised. Right. Okay, so we we have basically done this second part, um, uh, and we there are five parts to this bill. Uh, I don't believe we talked about, about the. Uh, uh, vocational rehabilitation, which is part one, uh, nor are we, uh, we got into, at least from the steps I presented on both part three and part five, and and, uh, and I believe Dave Waters talked about part five, as, you know, part, part four, was it? Let's see, no, nobody's talked about part four yet. Oh, except uh, Senator Waters was introduced. He just introduced it. So um, we can keep driving through this thing, um, but or we can take a half hour break. What are, what's the uh, the feeling of those on the committee right now? Why don't you go for another half hour? See where we are. Okay. Uh, any anybody objecting to go through to one o'clock and see where we are at that time? Let's drive. Okay, good. Okay, so um, do we have anybody uh, signed up to speak on part one? Let's get that. Uh, people have not signed up in, in a particular order. Do you have? Oh. Is there anybody out there that's an attendee that would like to speak to part one of this bill, SB 148? If so, please put your hand up. Okay, we do have one person who is, has their hand raised. They're not signed up, but we can unmute them. Lisa. Why don't we unmute the individual and, and have okay. the individuals uh, address part one. Welcome Ms. Hats to education. You need to unmute. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Lisa Henson Hats. I'm the vocational rehabilitation director from the Department of Education. Um, thank you, um, uh, Representative Ladd and committee, uh, for allowing me to speak. Um, I did sign up this morning. I apologize for not being on the roster earlier. Um, what I did wanted to say in terms of part one is that vocational rehabilitation uh, has been undergoing a whole host of um, changes. Um, and one of those uh, 
has been uh, updating our administrative rules. And as we reviewed our administrative rules through both internal review as well as uh, a legislative budget assistant internal audit um, this last couple years, there were several areas of our administrative rules that were identified needing update. And um, so we were able to um, update those. And what you see in, in the language in this bill are some areas that we needed to repeal. And the uh, primary reason for that is that either they're no longer um, administered by the program and administered by some other party or they're just not programs that are available any longer. And so that is, uh, that is the reason for that language within the bill. And I would certainly be willing to take any questions that anyone has uh, on any part in there. Thank you very much, Ms. Hatch. Is H-A-T-Z, right? Yes. Yep. Thank, uh, thank you very much. Are there any questions regarding part one now? So it sounds like some administ administrative changes to try and get current. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So with that, we can move on to part, part we have two. Starting three, I don't know that we took questions yeah. people have. I, see, I don't think we have taken questions on part three. So are there any, is there anybody out there in the attendee list that would like to testify on part three of SB 148? If so, would you please uh, raise your hand? Mr. Chair, maybe, oh, we do have someone. I was going to say maybe it would be helpful to talk about the content of the bill being the sports injuries. Um, yeah. We do have Rebecca Stearns, so I will. Okay, Could you come up, Rebecca Stearns. Welcome to education. Hello there. Can you all hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Okay. Well, um, good afternoon. Honorable members of the committee, thank you for having me today. I'm excited um, to be here with you to talk about this bill. Um, as you already heard, my name is uh, Rebecca Stearns. I am the COO of the Corey Stringer Institute, and I'm here today representing the Institute's full support for part three of SB 148 Emergency Action Plans for Sports. So the mission um, of the Corey Stringer Institute is to provide research, education, advocacy, and consultation for, to maximize performance, optimize safety, and ultimately prevent sudden death for the athlete, warfighter, and laborer. And so our goal is to reduce catastrophic injuries related to the top causes of death. And there are four conditions that really make up over 90% of the sudden deaths that we see in athletes. And this includes cardiac arrest, exertional heat stroke, traumatic head injuries, and exertional cycling. And just those four do make up 90% of the deaths that we see. And so if you look at the years between, or the five years between 2015 and 2019, we lost about 335 athletes, high school athletes' lives in the US just um, to these sudden cardiac or sudden events. And so, it, even though we did lose those athletes, we do believe that through state policy requirements, we are confident that more athletes can go home to their families and their parents at the end of the night. So, this bill specifically enacts five vital health and safety components that benefit the high school athletes in the state of New Hampshire. So I'm just gonna go through those very briefly. The first um, is mandating emergency action plans. And so just alone having an emergency action plan and a plan in place when a catastrophic injury does happen improves the survival of cardiac events by 35%. And so part of having an emergency action plan also includes other components which are supported by this bill. One of them being outlining the uh, automated external defibrillator access. And we know that each year, uh, one in 36 high schools will have a student who suffers a cardiac ar arrest and survival rates are currently around 54% at the high school level for athletes who suffer cardiac arrest. However, in cases where there is an AED and it's used, we know that the survival rate is, is as high as 89%. And then another policy included in the bill would be related to having a weather policy and specifically a wet bulb globe temperature policy. And this policy has resulted in over 35% less, 
reduction in heat exhaustion cases when it is mandated. A heat acclimatization policy is also included. And we've seen where a heat acclimatization policy is mandated and it's provided a 55% reduction in heat illnesses. And lastly, it includes provisions for a cold water immersion policy. We know that cold water immersion can save 100% of the heat stroke victims when it's applied within 15 minutes. So all of these are established best practices and policies that are supported by leading sport health and safety organizations such as the National Athletic Trainers Association and the American College of Sports Medicine. And there are over 120 schools in New Hampshire and we know that about 42% of those or almost 9,000 students don't have access to an athletic trainer. And this is the typical medical provider who creates and implements these policies. So it makes it that much more vital to have these laws to ensure basic health and safety policy is implemented for all athletes. So even, even for those schools that do have athletic trainers, we do know that gaps in these policies still exist. Our most recent survey showed that there are almost 4,000 New Hampshire athletes at a school with an athletic trainer, but there's no established emergency action plan. So th that obviously is why this bill could allow for equal health and safety protection across all athletes in the state. So it is our hope that through the continued adoption of best practices, we'll continue to see reductions in the senseless sport related deaths. So each of the topic areas that I've addressed today are currently legislated in at least one or more other states. For example, seven states have legislation that every school in their state have an emergency action plan. 15 other states have language to support AEDs in athletic venues nine of which were adopted just in the last five years alone. And I'd just like to point out that in addition, if this, if this bill does pass, the Corey Stringer Institute is part of its grant program that is sponsored by the National Athletic Trainers Association and the NFL. We'll be coordinating a meeting in New Hampshire with leaders um, that are responsible for high school sport health and safety to compile and prepare all the resources to help support successful implementation of these policies. So adopting this bill would provide necessary and basic policies to ensure that no other athletes' lives are needlessly lost. So thank you again for your attention today. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Are there, are there questions from the committee? Not seeing any hands, thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Do we have, yes. I don't know if the uh, attendee is first name is Leonard or last name is Leonard. Okay, I have uh, promoted you to education. Go ahead, please. There. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Good afternoon. Thank you, committee, for uh, for allowing me to speak on this topic of uh, SB 148. Um, as I've been an athletic trainer um, for uh, several years, um, I'm the president-elect of the state of New Hampshire, um, and I wanted to speak on this in a couple of different aspects. Uh, number one. Uh, having dealt with a lot of uh, severe injuries and things uh, that have uh, come up in my career, both co collegiate and high school, um, I see that knowing, having people know where to go, what to do, how to react um, is a major thing. And it helps to prevent, as, we, as, as was mentioned earlier, um, some severe injuries and different things that happen. My point that I want to speak on this comes to the point where if we can get this passed, I want to make sure that it's very well known that we need to not drop the ball after it's passed and after schools go ahead and write these policies, that they make sure that these policies are readdressed you know, yearly or in a, in a timely manner. Because I can see that things get written, addressed, but we always change. We have different coaches, we have different athletic trainers, we have different administrators, and they all come through. And if it's not addressed on a regular basis, I think things get lost. 
Um, and it's as simple as, as, as people knowing that you stand at the end of X road and have somebody there uh, waving down the ambulance to point them in the direction to where they need to go. Um, so on that point, that I mean, that's my main point is, yes, I'd love to see the, the bill pass. I think it'll be a, a huge uh, plus for the state of New Hampshire, for the, uh, the Athletics Association, things like that. But I want to make sure that we stay on top of it to be able to allow um, schools to regulate and make sure that as you change coaches, as you change people, they are aware of it. And that's part of their normal procedure of moving in. Um, you know, it's just as important as it is to lo learn your team and, and, and learn all the different administrative things that happen at a school. You need to learn that there's an emergency action plan and you need to be a part of it in order to make it a success. I don't want to take up any more time. I know that you guys are, have been really pushing through and getting for lunch, but I'll address any questions if anybody has them. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes, Representative Shaw. Can you um, identify yourself? Oh, Please. my name is Leonard Angeli. I'm the president elect of the National of the New Hampshire Athletic Trainers Association. Actually, uh, he's number two on our list. Number two. I see him on our printout. And I'm also an athletic. Yeah, we've got it. Thank you. Are there, Sorry about that. Are there any uh, other questions for Leonard? Thank you very much for hanging with us and, and, and testifying today. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. Um, okay, so with that, we're gonna close this section, part three, and move on to part four, which deals with the definition of private post-secondary career school. Do we have any hands up for that? Not yet. Yeah. 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 There's, there's several there now. Okay, so welcome to education. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Welcome, Ms. Moore. I'm sorry, I just got booted off after being on for hours and then my turn to talk. Um, actually, since Senator Ward is not available, would it be possible for Shannon Roche to go before me because she has some background information that will be important before I do my testimony? That's no problem. Go ahead. Um, Thank you. Okay, Ms. Roche, I believe you're next. Welcome to education. Wonderful. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you. Um, my name is Shannon Roach and I serve as the president and chief executive officer of Yoga Alliance. We are the largest nonprofit association representing yoga teachers, almost all of whom operate as small businesses or sole proprietorships. We're also proud to count 35 yoga schools and 478 yoga teachers in New Hampshire among our members. So again, thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of Senate Bill 148 Part, uh, part 4. As you know, the existing law authorizes the Department of Education to license businesses that provide occupational training. Importantly, the, the licenses do not necessarily apply to every business in the state that offers skills instruction or advanced education, but rather programs that are occupational in nature. Late last year, for the first time, the department began, began requiring some yoga providers who offer advanced yoga programs, which are sometimes known in the yoga community as quote unquote yoga teacher trainings, to become licensed. This raised two concerns for our small business members. First, the licensure requirements and fees were, were unduly burdensome to small businesses, especially in a time of COVID, of course. And second, yoga programs in this case had been mischaracterized as career schools. We, we Yoga Alliance, brought these concerns to the department and we very much appreciate their dialogue. Um, through that dialogue and our discussions, we learned that a primary concern of the departments is consumer protection, meaning ensuring that individuals who enroll in and spend money on certain kinds of programs would be protected if a school can't or doesn't deliver for some reason. We certainly agree with the need to protect consumers and as such, of course, we support Senate Bill 148 because the legislation squarely addresses the concerns of the yoga community broadly, of small businesses, and as we understand it, of the department. 
Um, first, the legislation exempts those small businesses with an annual gross tuition of $100,000 or less from licensure requirements. We understand that this exemption is supported by officials in the department and reflects, and we feel it reflects the burden of licensure on small businesses. And second, the legislation exempts instructional programs for teaching fitness and recreational wellness, but also provides that any entity with a gross annual income of over $100,000 from those programs would obtain a surety bond. This provision recognizes legitimate consumer protection concerns by requiring those large yoga programs to obtain a surety bond just like all the other programs licensed by the department. But at the same time, the provision recognizes that advanced yoga classes are not in fact career schools. While these advanced classes, as I mentioned, are often called teacher trainings in our community, the name is somewhat of a misnomer because the classes are not actually a prerequisite for teaching yoga to others. And because most individuals by their own um, sort of reporting participate in these programs to deepen their personal practice or to practice yoga in a group setting. And I'll just take one 30 seconds to help maybe understand what I mean by deepening one's personal practice. It's a little bit of a uh, term of art in our community. So just to help sort of set the ground there, I'd like to just share that, you know, the common understanding of yoga as a type of exercise that may involve specific poses or great flexibility um, is, is sort of is insufficient and incomplete. Um, in fact, yoga is actually a, a philosoph philosophical or some consider it a spiritual discipline for which the postures themselves are just a method of observing the teachings. Um, the advanced yoga programs are a vehicle for those who wish to learn more about those other components to do so. So that's what I mean when I say deepening one's personal practice. It's really sort of a, a study session. Um, and then just to share that, you know, for those handful of folks who do go through the program to teach and who eventually go on to teach, very few of them teach yoga as their primary career um, or singular source of income. So just you know, in, to close, I would say the licensure requirements for private post-secondary career schools are simply a bad fit for yoga programs for these programs in particular, and are geared for more traditional school settings and educational programs. The licensure application, for example, asks for admission requirements, the school's policy on the transfer of credits, an overview of curriculum offerings, and a description of the school's grading system, among many other requirements which simply aren't applicable to these kinds of programs. Exempting advanced yoga programs from the state's private post-secondary career school laws would align with how most other states treat these programs as well. The majority do not license yoga teacher training programs, quote unquote, as career schools. For these reasons, we ask that you support Senate Bill 148, and I'm happy to take any questions the committee might have. And I, again, would just really like to thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Shannon. Are there any questions? Or Shannon? Just real quick, Rick. Yes, go ahead, Dave. Thanks, thanks very much, Mr. Chair, and thanks very much, Ms. Roche, for uh, joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm interested. Where did you, uh, where did you hear, or where did you learn that the um, um, primary role of the Department of Education is consumer protection? I, forgive me if I misspoke. The, the, I don't think that the primary role is consumer protection, but my understanding from conversations we had with, with relevant representatives in the department who would be overseeing the implementation of this provision um, is that one of their concerns that, that sort of prompted this provision in the first place was one of consumer protection. Um, so I believe my comment was meant to be specific to that office. Okay, no, thank, thanks that very role, much. I, I, I certainly agree with your, um, your statements uh, with respect to um, um, you know, the intention of the uh, primary and secondary career development being really, you know, beyond the scope of, 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 um, of wellness um, training. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, further questions? Not seeing any hands. Thank you very much, Shannon. Thank you. Now we can go back to Maureen. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I was actually the first yoga school, uh, first I'll introduce myself. My name is Maureen Meller and I'm the owner of Yoga NH. It's a business that has led yoga classes and trainings and events throughout New Hampshire since 2004. Though I currently live in Dover, I lived in Concord for 25 years and I had my business in the capital city for 14 of those years. Although I'm here to tell you about my story related to this particular bill, I know that I speak on behalf of many other yoga businesses. So thank you so much for your time. I was the first school that the first yoga business that the DOE reached out to. 
And it was very clear in those conversations that it was related to consumer protection around financial concerns related to students if they had any issues. And in my years of doing business, there have never been any issues. And when we were on our Senate call, the Senate even stated that when they, that in their mind, they didn't know of any, uh, they, they actually asked the DOE if there had been any issues related to student protection related to financial concerns for yoga business, and they said no. As Shannon said, right now, um, some of the career schools, you know, it, yoga really just doesn't fit. It's like CPAs, I'm looking at my list of what I found on the Department of Ed last night, electrical technology, computer technology, LNAs, dental assistants. These are truly careers where people take the program to become proficient in that profession. And the yoga business, that's not the norm. In my 16 years of leading yoga programming, I've had hundreds of graduates and they have been primarily to deepen their yoga practice. And in fact, many of the people who have taken our trainings, um, I know that um, Katie will speak after me about some of the um, experience she had with leading some trainings. They have included doctors, nurses, physical therapists, lawyers, social workers, even one of your fellow representatives has graduated from my teacher training program. They have other careers that are their main state of profession. And they do this to deepen their practice, to learn more about yoga, to share it with their family and friends, and to deepen their own spirituality. And that's really just, you know, in our mind, a fancy word for learning about living life on and off the yoga mat and just really exploring more deeply. So um, let's see what else I wanted to say. That a lot of times people who take the, biz take the program, they have other businesses, they have other jobs. We already established that. Even though I've had my business for 16 years, I worked for UNH for 15 of those years and currently I'm a finance director at a nonprofit. And the reason why I mention that is we are not doing this to make money in that particular career. We have other careers and this sort of augments that for purposes that are important to us more related to a hobby as opposed to a career. And in terms of the consumer protection programs and um, regulations in New Hampshire, Yoga businesses are required to follow the law around any consumer protection laws that there are that are outside of the scope of this DOE bill. So we really support Senate Bill 148. And I thank you so much for your time. If you have any questions, I'd thank be happy you very much, to answer. Maureen. Are there any questions for Maureen Miller? I'm not seeing any hands up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome to education. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here and happy to speak on this uh, in our support of SB 148 Part 4. So again, thank you very much for hearing um, what I have to share. My name is Katie O'Connell and I own Dragonfly Yoga Barn, which is way up here in North Sandwich, New Hampshire, actually really more central part of the state. I have been practicing yoga for over 20 years, and I have been teaching yoga in New Hampshire since 2003. My husband and I relocated a 275-year-old barn from Moultonboro, just down the road, and put it up here in Sandwich. So part of our business actually really is founded on maintaining the, the natural landscape and incorporating that into our business, which is, I think, really cool. Um, that's also the same year that I finished teaching 15 years as a public school teacher in the state of New Hampshire. So after rebuilding our antique barn, I opened up my studio, I left my public school teaching job, and I've been teaching here at Dragonfly for the past 12 years in my small town. Locals and out-of-staters alike have often called Dragonfly my business, the heart of the community. We offer a variety of programs um, to serve our local pop, uh, popula population. It's always been a bit of a hustle, and I think this is an important piece that I want to impart, to create um, programs that are, you know, really meet a broad population here where I am in Sandwich. I've always worn many hats to keep Dragonfly Yoga Barn's doors open. 
and this has really never been truer than it is right now. I have been closed for the past 16 months as a business and I've done all of my teaching online the same way that we are in this meeting right now on Zoom. So um, getting my doors back open is really important and yoga teacher training programs are a part of what I do. Um, I am here to express my strong belief that imposing licensure on yoga teacher training programs in New Hampshire will negatively impact not only my studio as a small business in the state, but other studios like mine that offer life-changing studies in yoga, and exactly as Maureen was suggesting. The financial burden of licensure with its additional expenses not only puts the ability of studio owners like me who offer training programs in jeopardy, but quite frankly, the fees also have the capacity to close the doors of some small businesses like mine that do piecemeal together a lot of different threads to make up what one might actually call a reasonable living. We don't really, you know, in the yoga world, we don't really call our, our earnings a salary. There's really no such thing. Um, this is problematic for small businesses like mine who run only one training per year and rely on multiple streams of income to remain open, and that's my situation personally. You've already heard from Maureen and Shannon about their broad experiences, um, Maureen in particular as a teacher and a business owner in New Hampshire, and I would second every note that they both shared and punctuate Maureen's point that most of our yoga students come to us after years of personal practice and most often to deepen their own practice of self, which really is that body, mind, spirit. And they elect to engage in a personal development training like ours um, to that end. I also want to note that I have been an adjunct faculty member at Plymouth State University and a high school English teacher in the state of New Hampshire for 15 years. I, I completed my, my work um, in the public sector of education um, gosh, 12 years ago now since I opened my business here. So I can personally attest to the difference between training students for a career and what it means to share and teach programs that are intended for personal growth and development, like what I'm doing now. And a yoga teacher training is certainly the latter. A rare few will ever call yoga a career. I don't think I've ever heard any of my colleagues use that word. Um, most yoga teachers do not receive salaries. They would not call yoga training a standalone income. Um, yoga teaching a uh, standalone income. I think most of us do it because we love it and because we know how beneficial it is for people in our community to practice yoga. And finally, those who go on to share yoga with others rarely leave another job solely to teach yoga, as Maureen suggested. It's just simply not feasible to, for most of us to do that. Additionally, many students who study with us do go back to their communities to offer yoga and meditation and, and other um, realms of yoga by donation oftentimes and often to underserved populations, at-risk communities, and even to colleagues at their real job, you know, where corporate uh, folks might be actually making a salary. Yoga is starting to, you know, move into these realms and with really good reason and great effect. Um, this is where we can alleviate stress, tension, help knit people into fellowships that promote overall wellness, and I would also say that our teachers have brought to their respective communities practices that can really only be seen as enrichment and that serve the human spirit as well as, really important right now, boost our immune system. After the stress of the past year, I would argue that really what we all need is more yoga and taking yoga schools out of this designation as a career program will certainly help that endeavor, in my opinion, and I believe the opinion of my colleagues here. So again, with so much gratitude, just thank you for the opportunity to share today. Thank you very much, Katie. Yeah, we can all use a little yoga right about now. <laughs> After lunch. <laughs> yeah. uh, lunch. Alicia, your hand is up. Yes, I just had a question. Um, do you know if there are any uh, schools, entities, whatever that have a gross annual income of over a hundred thousand in the state that's directly attributable to instruction, et cetera. You know, is there anybody who actually would need to have a surety bond in the state of New Hampshire? That you know of? Representative, I'm not sure if you're if you're asking me or or anybody else in this body. Anybody but... who can answer it. Yeah. I am unaware of, of other the specific financials of other schools. Um, I just know that most of the schools and the, the colleagues of mine that I am aware of and work with, most of them do not have those kinds of figures in their yoga teacher training programs, no. Thank you. I, I think uh, what we like to do, are there any further questions for Katie right now? We can get an answer from Steve Appleby, possibly on from the Department of Education. Well, I have one. I, it'll be really quickly. Um, 
thank you. Go Mr. ahead. <laughs> He's rolling his eyes. I just wanted to say hi, Katie. I've taken your yoga retreats before. You don't probably remember me, but I think everybody should should have a retreat with you if you uh, want to make that happen. <laughs> thank you, Deborah. I do. I recognize your face, and it's been a while, but thank you. It's so good to see you. Have a good day. You as well. Thanks. Just for for retreat. Yeah. Yoga retreat. Sorry about that. It Are you the one that you're talking about? No, no, I'm not. Uh, Tim, 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 Tim Lang. I think it might be Representative Lang. Okay. 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 Um, <laughs> any further questions for Katie? <clears throat> Thank you very much. Yeah. Enjoy it up there in the sandwich area. All righty. Um, Let's do Steve Appleby and see if he has an answer to that question for a representative like this. Here he is. Welcome to education. Good afternoon now. Thank you, Steve Appleby, uh, Division Director at the Department of Education. Um, the direct answer to the question representative regarding um, did you mean yoga schools of over $100,000 in annual gross tuition or schools in general? I guess is my question back. Um, the, in the thing, it, it specifies uh, gross annual income over 100000 et cetera, et cetera, um, would provide, need to provide a surety bond. And I'm just wondering if we have anybody that actually fits into that, it would actually need to provide us a surety bond. Yep, okay, so um, I can tell you that statewide, we currently license about 65 schools. And of that 65, about a dozen are under 100,000 in annual gross tuition. And these schools span everything from um, electrician, computer, uh, dog training, uh, various types of vocations. As far as specifically yoga schools, I don't know of any at this moment. However, we only license a small handful currently, and they're all relatively small schools that are under the 100,000. So, so can I have a yes, follow-up? Yes, so my follow-up is, is there any reason why we need to have that section in there um, if it's fine for smaller schools to not put up a surety, why do larger schools need to put up a surety? Um, so the, uh, the, let me back up. So section M makes perfect sense to exempt the schools with annual gross tuition of under 100,000. That would remove the burden from our smallest schools, which are, as one of the um, witnesses mentioned, these are all small businesses. And this would eliminate the $450 annual fee that they pay currently, as well as their need to have a surety bond, which at that level probably cost them several hundred dollars a year as well to maintain. Um, and the next section is, is somewhat redundant, and we're actually a little concerned at the department that the way it is worded might require us to actually license more schools, not less schools. And let me tell you what I mean by that. The wording currently used in the statute speaks of vocational education. Um, this wording, entities offering instructional program or courses for teaching fitness and recreational wellness, it doesn't speak at all there about vocational training. It, so what we're worried about is that uh, fitness clubs that teach classes to people um, under the guise of potentially them, you know, conducting various types of classes. Again, not a vocation, but um, this exists currently in the state. So we're a little concerned that this wording actually expands the scope, not um, limits the scope. And I think that would be contrary to the goal of this legislation. So do you see a problem with taking N out completely? We do not, and that would be that would be my recommendation, um, but of course that's it's up to the legislature, but it, it seemed to be expanding the net, not, not reeling it in. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Steve, can you please explain to me uh, or give me some examples of what these vocational schools would be that uh, you alluded to some others there just briefly. Can you go through some of the, you know, the areas which we're talking about? Yes, sure. Thank you for the question, Representative Ladd. Uh, as I said, we license about 65 schools in areas as diverse as uh, pet grooming. We have several schools that teach people how to be professional pet groomers. Um, we also have a number of schools that teach uh, individuals various uh, computer occupations. So computer programming, systems engineering. Uh, we have schools that uh, have electrician components. Um, we have schools that have um, uh, uh, massage training. Uh, again, instructing individuals how to become massage teachers. So really it's a variety. We have several bartending schools um, that teach people how to be professional bartenders. So it really covers a lot of ground. And I would also just like to add in, if I could, Representative Ladd, we do occasionally have a precipitous school closure. And we recently, back in December, had a school close uh, in Manchester, New Hampshire, a nursing school. And uh, their sudden closure because of the surety bond that we require, um, approximately $690,000 in tuition is being refunded to students who couldn't complete their programs. So although it doesn't come up that often that a school closes, it does happen. That, that's, that's, that's information that's uh, worth our attention that you know when somebody closes, then to have the, the bond to support somebody that's already paid that tuition, so there's a reimbursement of some kind. Um, so are there further questions for Steve? Yes, uh, Representative Likens. Yes, so um, following on that discussion then, if we take out N, would that surety bond still be required for all of those other things that we're just taking out the part for the yoga instructors? Yes. Um, what this would do is it would merely eliminate the requirement for schools that have less than $100,000 a year in annual gross tuition. It would remove the requirement for them to be licensed and the associated requirement of a surety bond. But everybody who has higher revenue than 100,000 per year would in fact still need to get a surety bond and get licensed. Thank you. Any further questions of the Department of Education? Uh, Rep. Tanner has had Rep. Tanner. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Mr. Appleby. Um, so a lot of yoga centers are called ashrams, and they are actually uh, religious as well as as training schools. Um, how do we differentiate between schools that teach yoga, um, like an ashram, uh, or even a yoga instructor, and other religious schools that um, in fact have education that may be like a carpenter uh, carpentry uh, education on as part of their religious mission. Um, I think we're getting into a really slippery slope with, with all this, trying to certify all these small uh, different types of, of schools, um, or I would put quote schools on it uh, for people that are trying to get into these either secondary jobs or their, their hobbies. Uh, you know, and, and we're not so worried about private colleges um, that maybe don't have a surety bond with them. So how do you make the differentiation between religious education and um, ashrams or places where they actually train for yoga? Thank you for the question, Representative Tanner. That, it is a slippery slope, I, I would concur. Um, we look to the current statutes as our guide right now, and the distinction that we make is, is this program vocational in nature? So in the example of a yoga school, am I teaching my students yoga and whatever goes along with that curriculum? Or am I teaching my students 
how to be yoga teachers. That is the difference. Just practicing yoga is avocational. Learning how to teach other people yoga that I could then earn a living from, that's vocational. And that's what we have articulated in the, in the statute. And that's how we look at this. So it doesn't make, the statute does not delineate between for-profit or non-profit, does not delineate between secular or religious. Um, if a religious organization were to decide to um, start training massage therapists and how to become massage therapists, they would see, they would need to be licensed if, you know, if the 100,000 um, uh, amendment here goes in, if they did, you know, had more than $100,000 a year in revenue, they would need to get licensed, whether they're a religious entity or not, because they're teaching a vocation. Can uh, I have a follow-up? Yes, you may, Representative Tanner. So what about internships or people who learn to barber now that we've passed that law uh, or trying to? Suppose they are doing internships with their parents and maybe some of the kids come in uh, and they're teaching them a vocation. I mean, Boy Scouts teach vocation to some level. You know, um, I just, I, th I think, <laughs> I just have a hard time with this whole uh, sort of, you know, licensing issue uh, of these smaller groups. Uh, you know, the, the people are not in it to make big bucks at all. Thank you, Representative. Um, it wasn't a question in that, so it was more of a comment, sorry. Yeah, I was just, if I could just, um, I would note that um, I, it's our position that legislation actually will help those smallest of businesses by setting the bar at 100,000 a year. Currently, they all have to get a license. Now, the entities that uh, have annual gross tuition of 100,000 will be exempted from licensure. So. Um, to your, to your point, I don't have an answer either to your comment, but um, that's that's the current state. And it's been in, that statute has been in effect for decades. I thank you, Representative Tanner and uh, Mr. Appleby. I can remember we had this discussion on in this committee at least twelve years ago with Dr. Ed McKay when we were talking about post-secondary career schools and, and um, those uh, institutions that were putting the sign out front saying school, and then the, the customer or the individual walking down the street says, well, here's a, a license or approved school. Um, how do we guarantee now that somebody's not gonna put the sign school up in front and, and have an income of less than $100,000, but you know, um, and the person on the street's not going to know whether that's a licensed school or not. Is there, is this, um, do they get licensure without having to pay this 450 bucks or, or how's that work? Or is it needed? Uh, thank you. So um, the, if the current statute, not, notwithstanding this amendment to the statute, the current statute is anyone that's, that's conducting classes that are vocational in nature, they call themselves a school, an institute. Uh, those individuals would need to seek licensure from the department. And one of the requirements is that they publicly display that license, typically in their lobby or waiting area. So that, that license is displayed publicly. Um, and uh, we also ask for that to be in their catalog. Their catalog can be online, it can be printed, but we ask that they also put down that they are licensed by the Department of Education. And if there are student complaints, they direct them to the Department of Education. So I'll follow up. So if they have a gross income, a gross tuition income of, of less than $100,000, can they still put a sign up saying school? Um, per this, if this legislation were to pass, yes. Okay, thank you. Further questions of the department? Not seeing any hands. Thank you very much, Mr. Appleby. Do we have any other folks on part four? Uh, actually, we have four hands raised. Uh, three people who have 
previously spoken. Yes, I think, so. Okay. Yeah, we we will not be taking people. At pre this is not a discussion. That's testimony, okay. so we won't take anybody to, that's testified for unless it's a a senator trying to qualify no, I don't something. So, uh, Maureen Marston, I believe we have not heard from her yet. Okay, welcome, Ms. Marston. Okay, there we go. Um, Representative Ladd and members of the uh, House Education Committee, I'm very obviously not Senator Ward and very obviously not Marie Marston. I'm Griffin Roberge, um, Senator Guida's legislative aide. Could Senator Reagan, Senator Reagan, Can we have that somewhere. Very sorry, members of the committee. Um, Senator Ward is currently in caucus and uh, her, his, her assistant is helping other people at the moment. Um, Senator Ward asked that I read into the record uh, her written testimony for part four of Senate Bill 148. Uh, would that be okay with the members of the committee? That would be fine. Part four of Senate Bill 148 deals with a problem that came to our attention because of the very limited, uh, I'm sorry, very broad wording of what a post-secondary career school is under our law which is capturing programs not intended to require the strict licensing and other requirements listed in RSA 188-G. It came to our attention that programs like yoga instruction were recently deemed by the Department of Education to require post-secondary education licensure, which is placing a costly uh, burden, um, administrative compliance and oversight that doesn't fit within that profession. RSA 188G lists uh, Department of Education oversight to include the premise, uh, I'm sorry, the premises, the curriculum, teaching materials, faculty performance, sales literature, financial data, and other matters which are relevant. <clears throat> the law is structured to cover more formal educational institutions like nursing and truck driving schools that actually have curriculum and credits and a degree. The recent interpretation is placing requirements that make most small yoga programs prohibitive from even being in business. With the help of the yoga industry and the Department of Education, uh, part four is good pro-small business legislation that removes an obstacle that is harming New Hampshire businesses. It has two pieces. First, it carves out of the law all very small businesses that take in under $100,000 of income. Secondly, for wellness programs like yoga, if they earn more than $100,000 from teaching, they must still obtain the bond requirement that is in the current law to give consumers protection in the event a business ceases operating and collected income in advance of the program. Um, that is the written testimony that Senator Ward wished me to share with the members of the committee. Um, I respectfully would not like to take any questions because I do not wish to speak much more for Senator Ward at this time. Thank you very much. Do, does, do you have a, a written testimony that you can get to our clerk here? I will have her assistant email it to you and the other members of the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Representative Ladin. Hey, have a good one. You too. All right. Okay, we're, we're going to then, we have nobody else that uh, has not spoken uh, regarding part four. So we are going to now move on to the last part of this bill, Senate Bill 148, uh, part five. And I would like to ask that any uh, member of the public that's an attendee, would you please put your hand up if you'd like to speak to part five of of uh, SB 148, which deals with environmental and outdoor education. Welcome, Jason. 
Uh, hello, I want to uh, thank the members of the committee for their time today. And with respect to everyone's time, I'm going to abridge my remarks. Uh, but I've submitted full comments, which I invite you to review outside of the hearing. Uh, my name is Jason Seaman. I live in Durham and work as an associate professor of outdoor leadership and management in the Recreation Management and Policy Department at UNH. I'll note before I share my comments that I'm sharing my own personal and professional views today and not necessarily those of the university. I'm a lifelong New Hampshire resident and, and have long pursued outdoor recreation in many corners of the state. Moreover, I used to work at the school and district levels in just the kinds of programs that Section 5 of SB 148 would support. And I now study outdoor education, how outdoor education and recreation supports youth development. So I'm very pleased to see SB 148 before you today. Some of the recent papers my colleagues and I have published, it, have published indicate how youth from northern New Hampshire participate in outdoor activities at higher rates than their peers nationwide. The most highly involved youth not only report stronger connections to their communities, they also show, show more favorable post-secondary aspirations and after graduation attend college at higher rates. Our research also suggests, unsurprisingly, the rural youth evaluate their post-secondary options in light of their perceived opportunities for education and employment. In short, youth can learn to love the outdoors like I did as a kid growing up here, but if there aren't viable opportunities for work along with ways to imagine yourself doing that work, it's tough to know where to channel that interest and that passion. Fortunately, the state is now wisely investing in outdoor recreation economic development in order to capitalize on the true New Hampshire advantage our abundant outdoor amenities and strong outdoor culture. This is why SB 148 is so critical and why I am compelled to comment today. It can help connect those dots, outdoor recreation as a growing economic engine on the one hand, and the outdoors as a powerful venue for forming post-secondary aspirations on the other hand. SB 148 will help schools and youth serving agencies align behind these important state priorities and build a thriving citizenry and workforce in New Hampshire, whether directly in the outdoor recreation economy or in other careers. I think it is helpful to consider SB 148 not merely as an education bill, but as an investment in the state's future workforce and in the future adults who are committed to sustaining its quality of life. In some, my comments have not focused on, this, on any specific learning out outcomes or schools per se, uh, but I wanna emphasize the aspects of the outdoors that support who people are and who they can become. I can personally attest to the strong intergenerational bonds to New Hampshire that are promoted through early exposure to the outdoors. And my research also shows how this influences the way young people think about their futures. That's why I'm asking you to think about SB 148 as an investment into the future of New Hampshire, where opportunities are coming together to meet real educational, outdoor, and economic needs by promoting greater outdoor involvement among New Hampshire youth. Thank you again for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, are there questions for? I, I do have one question for you. Um, at UNH, where you, you are a professor, um, do they have a parks and recreation or do they have a recreation department which helps students be, get into the careers associated with outdoor recreation or indoor recreation as well? We do. That's my department. It's, it's called the Recreation Management and Policy Department. Uh, and we have three, three what we call major options. So it's one major with three different options students can elect to, elect to choose. Uh, one is therapeutic recreation. Uh, and the, another is program and event management. So festival planning and, and those types of careers. And that often aligns with the hospitality and tourism industries. And then the, the no, newest development in that department is my option, which is the outdoor leadership and management department uh, option. And that uh, serves students who wanna go either into uh, outdoor guiding or outdoor leadership type positions or even parks and protected areas management. So uh, yes, sir, that, that, that's the department that I work in. Uh, that sounds like a, a wonderful experience. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Are there questions? From the committee. Not seeing any hands. Thank you very much for your testimony. Last person uh, that I show is Janice Crawford. I'm going to promote her to panelist. Welcome, Janice, to education. Go ahead, please. Hey. 
Thank you. Well, uh, you all deserve a huge applause for your work and your ability to sit through this. I This is my first time, so I sat through the entire thing only to have this opportunity <laughs> to speak on part five. Um, so I really feel for you and appreciate you. Thank you so much for the work you do to serve the state. Uh, my name is Janice Crawford. I am the executive director of the Mount Washington Valley Chamber of Commerce. I was a CTE uh, teacher back in the early 80s at the Region uh, 9 Vocational School in, in Wolfboro. It was one of my most favorite jobs. And I am now a trustee of the Northeast Waldorf Education Foundation, and I am really speaking for myself. I did learn a lot listening to people, so to make sure that I'm not, I don't get in trouble for advocating where I shouldn't advocate, I, I'm going to say that um, I don't, uh, I don't have a thought either way. I think that's what the people before me said. Um, but I do want to encourage you to support part five of this bill, uh, primarily because up here in the North Country, as was identified by one of the representatives, or maybe it was the Senator, uh, we have a huge outdoor recreation industry, and we also need more people to consider the workforce opportunities that that provides, even if it's not their actual career, but their volunteer service, such as the avalanche group, the rescue group, the stewardship of trails, um, working with the different organizations that are putting millions of dollars into the trails and volunteering for that uh, is so important. And to create that desire, I think that outdoor education and environmental education is very, very important to help the students understand the value of the world that they live in, especially up here, uh, if they're going to make their lives up here. Um, oftentimes they do leave, but we find that they come back. So uh, being able to share that with them so that they begin to have a respect and a desire to protect where we live is very, very important. As my role um, as a trustee of the uh, first public charter school that is Waldorf inspired and outdoor educated education, I can attest to the value of outdoor education for the students, uh, for their desire to come to school, the ability to stay outside and learn from the environment has been very key. It is part of our curriculum, but of course now with COVID, uh, you've seen that many, many, many schools have picked up on the idea of outdoor education. So I just wanted to share that with you and uh, thank you for all the work that you do. I will get off now because I'm hungry and I can imagine that you are as well. And thank you again for uh, sitting here for these long periods of time. Um, and so thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Janice. Are, are you willing to take any questions? Certainly. Uh, Janice, I do have one. <laughs> um, coming from the North Country myself, our school district takes kids every year for a period of nine or so weeks and they ski at Cannon Mountain one day a week. Is that a typical activity done for school districts in the North Country? Uh, yes, we have that program here that's run by the Eastern Slope Ski um, Group. They raise the money to help provide that opportunity for students to go to the ski areas. Our uh, public charter school went this year. It was one of only two schools that took advantage of it because of the concern with COVID and the transportation issues that COVID put on uh, public schools. SAU 9 has always in the past uh, involved their students. It's a huge program and very, very important. Thank you very much, Janice. Are there further questions from the committee? Not seeing any hands. Thank you very much and have a good day. You too. That's all the people that are wanting to testify on 148. So with that, uh, I will close the hearing on 128 and maybe we can get a report on how many people support, don't support, or testified. 
Uh, it would appear 47 spoke in support. 47 in support. Zero opposed. Zero opposed. Zero neutral. Zero neutral. That's, that's, that's it. That, that's for that, the whole bill, right? Yeah. That's correct. The whole bill, all 148. Okay, so that closes our hearings for today. As I mentioned at the beginning, no executive sessions today. A lot of food for thought today in 147, 148, and 44. So, <laughs> food for thought. <laughs> thank you. So, uh, thank you very much, everybody, for attending and, and, and getting us to it's now 135. It's time for lunch. Have a good day, everybody.